And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled U.S. Equity Market Structure Part 1, a review of the evolution of today's equity market structure and how we got here. And uh, we've got a busy uh, day ahead of us. Uh, we've got two panels, and uh, we are going get, to uh, get rolling here. So without objection, uh, as well, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is permitted to participate in today's subcommittee hearing. Mr. Loudermilk is a member of the Financial Services Committee, uh, and we appreciate his interest in this important topic. Uh, I now recognize myself for three minutes to give an opening statement. Modern equity markets trace their origin back to an agreement signed under the Buttonwood Tree on Wall Street in 1792, but over time, these markets have become essential to Main Street as well. Companies all around the world need access and the ability to raise capital for job creation, grow, to grow their businesses, and to innovate. Additionally, hardworking Americans rely on the capital markets to save for everything from college tuition to retirement. In 1975, Congress amended the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934 and directed the Securities and Exchange Commission to establish a, a national market system in which all orders to buy and sell securities would interact. Since that time, the structure of the U.S. equity markets has significantly evolved. Today's modern U.S. equity market structure has been shaped by four regulatory initiatives promulgated by the SEC. Order handling rules in 1996, regulation ATS in 1998, decimalization in 2000, and regulation NMS in 2005. Since 1975, there have been technological advances, as we all know, as we peer at our iPhones and other electronic devices. And today, a significant amount of trading is now performed by automated computer algorithms used by many different market participants. These participants include electronic market makers and high-frequency traders who seek to capture small profits from thousands of individual trades. These market participants also include large institutions seeking to accumulate significant positions without affecting the market. And they include broker-dealers seeking to provide retail investors with the best executions for their order. As trading has become increasingly automated, market activity is now measured in milliseconds and microseconds. Mm -hmm. By most objective measures, execution speeds, bid-ask spreads, trading costs, and, and market depth and liquidity, investors have, been, have benefited significantly from the development of more competitive equity markets and the rise of electronic trading. These improvements, however, do not mean that the current structure and operation of these markets is perfect. Some critics of the current market structure have pointed out that with around a dozen public exchanges and 50 alternative trading venues, today's equity markets are overly complex and fragmented. Others point to technical problems that have disrupted markets as evidence that the current market structure is not optimal. We all acknowledge that the U.S. equity markets are widely recognized for being the deepest, most liquid, and most competitive markets in the world. However, it doesn't mean that these markets are perfect and there is room for improvement. That is why a truly comprehensive review of equity market structure is long overdue. Today's hearing will review the current state of the U.S. equity markets and review how the current structure has evolved since the enactment of the Securities Act's amendments of 1975. We will hear from industry participants and experts on what is working well in today's equity markets as well as areas that need improvement or are impacting the optimal functioning of the markets. In order to move markets forward, we need to know where they have been. As a Michigan member, we often talk in car analogies, and I'd like to say in order to look forward through the windshield, we first must take a glimpse in the rearview mirror. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank our witnesses for being here and the chairman for holding this important hearing. The United States has the deepest, most liquid, and most efficient capital markets in the world. The strength of our markets is a key contributor to our country's overall economic strength. But we can always look at how we can improve them. We need to continually work to make sure that our markets are safe, competitive, innovative, and fair to all investors. The purpose of this hearing is to review the evolution of our equity market structure. And of course, this discussion would not be complete without a discussion of the SEC's regulation, national market system, NMS, which fundamentally overhauled market structure in the U.S. When the SEC passed Reg NMS 12 years ago, in fact, it will be exactly 12 years ago this Thursday, the goals were to promote price competition, protect investors, and enhance market efficiency. 
So after 12 years, it makes sense to make a step back, review the changes that have taken place, and ask, what did we get right in Reg NMS? What did we get wrong? And what can we improve? But first, it's important to remember that our equity markets are undoubtedly better today than they were a decade ago. Today's retail investors have better access to the markets at lower costs than ever before, and we should not lose sight of these benefits. However, our markets are by no means perfect, and I strongly believe that improvements can and should be made. In order to identify potential improvements, we must review what has changed as a result of Reg NMS and whether those changes were intended or unintended. Price competition has undoubtedly increased as the number of different trading venues available to investors has exploded. Some in the markets argue that this price competition has come at the expense of market efficiency. However, as the large number of trading venues has led to fragmented markets. There is obviously a fine line between too many trading venues and too few trading venues. And whether we have the right balance is one of the issues I hope we will explore today. As a few of the witnesses note in their testimony today, Reg NMS also promoted market-wide price competition, which undoubtedly lowered costs for investors, but also gave rise to high-frequency trading and prior prioritize speed over all else. Uh, another lesson from Reg NMS is that even small changes in market structure regulations can have large consequences. That's why I think that the best changes in market structure will be grounded in data and empirical evidence. I'm pleased that the SEC is currently conducting a tick size pilot program to test whether increasing the minimum trading increments will really enhance liquidity. This tick size pilot has gotten off to a bumpy start and the implementation costs were high, but I'm hopeful that it will yield solid data that we can use to improve the market structure. Finally, Reg NMS made so-called NMS plans much more important, which is the source of much controversy and which I think we'll hear a lot about today. NMS plans are essentially committees that administer key parts of the national market system, such as the public data feeds that show the best available price for each stock. These NMS plan committees are comprised of self-regulatory organizations, essentially the exchanges and FINRA. Neither the sell-side brokers nor the buy-side investors have a seat on these NMS plan committees and therefore don't get a vote on how these plans are operated. And as I said, this is the source of much controversy. So I'm pleased that we have all of the parties in this debate here with us today, and I hope that we can have a robust discussion of this issue. I look forward to the testimony from both of our panels, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, and the chair now <coughs> recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, the vice chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Hultgren, for two minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Henselling, for convening this important hearing today. Thank you to all of our panelists. Many of the issues we discuss in this subcommittee uh, are somewhat detailed, and I would say uh, the, the discussion today will even be more detailed and complex, but it's important for us to understand Congress has a responsibility to ensure that our equity markets are structured in a way that maximizes capital formation for job creators and protects the interest of investors saving for retirement. Since serving in Congress, the publication of Flash Boys piqued my interest in trying to better understand our equity markets. I did not come to the same conclusion as the author of the book, that our markets are rigged, but I it did bring some of these issues to the forefront for public debate, which I think is important. As Congress and the SEC review the rules governing our market structure, it's important we are all on the same page in terms of our objectives. By many measures, our equity markets are operating more efficiently, efficiently than they ever have. Spreads and execution costs are the lowest they've ever been, meaning it's more affordable for retail investors to participate in markets which, which historically were only accessible to the most sophisticated investors. However, it's also worth noting that a number of significant events have shaken investor confidence, which is foundational to our markets. For example, I remember visiting with a number of firms in Chicago on August 24th, 2015, when there was great volatility and at the time, an inexplicable dislocation between the prices of exchange-traded funds and their underlying securities. 
There are a lot of issues that merit discussion today, whether it's market pricing structures, speed bumps, market data, or order routing. But no aspect of our market structure should be debated in a silo. They are all far too inter interconnected. I believe our equity markets are functioning well, but if we do not continue to review opportunities for improvement, it may not be long before the United States leadership begins to falter. To that point, as European regulators implement MIFID II, our regulators should be engaged in the policy implications and take appropriate steps so the U.S. capital markets remain competitive. And while Congress will undertake its own work, I'm looking forward to your feedback on the work of the SEC and its Equity Market Structure Advisory Committee. Thank you again to all of our witnesses. I look forward to reviewing and discussing the recommendations detailed in your testimony. I'd also be remiss in not mentioning that Chris Kincannon, President and COO of the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, is testifying today. CBOE recently acquired BATS, which I believe will be a great help to Chicago to continue its role as a leader in the Midwest for finance. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I do want to, uh, as we start on this, I do want to say that uh, uh, today we are we're a busy day. We have two panels that are going to be happening, but this is actually uh, uh, based off of some of the work that our previous chairman of the Capital Markets uh, Subcommittee, uh, Scott Garrett, had done. He had convened some roundtables and really had started to get this conversation going. And uh, I think that this is an important time for us to work on a bipartisan basis uh, to, uh, to see where we could go to what these markets might look like uh, for the future. And uh, today we are very pleased to welcome on this first panel uh, Matt Lyons, who's the Senior Vice President and Global Trading Manager of the Capital Group on behalf of the Investment Company Institute, uh, Joseph uh, Saluzzi, partner of Themis Trading LLC, uh, Ari Rubenstein, uh, CEO of Global Trading Systems, and Jeff Brown, Senior Vice President, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs for Charles Schwab, and he's here on behalf of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. Uh, part of what I wanted to do was to get these participants in first, uh, and then our second panel, uh, which is going to consist of uh, Thomas Farley, President of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, Brad Katsuyama, CEO of the Investors Exchange, uh, Chris Kincannon, as uh, had been referenced, President and COO of the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. Uh, John Comerford, uh, Head of Global Trading Research of Instanet. And Tom Whitman, Executive Vice President and Global Head of Equities for NASDAQ. Uh, I wanted to get those participants in first and then get uh, those who, uh, who are running the markets uh, in for our second panel. So we're going to have a, a busy day, and uh, I really appreciate uh, all of the time that uh, you are uh, giving us here today. And uh, with that, I will recognize Mr. Lyons uh, first for an opening five-minute statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Huizenga. Uh, Ranking Member Maloney and the rest of the subcommittee, I just want to extend my thanks to inviting me to testify today about these important issues. My name is Matt Lyons. As you mentioned, I'm the Global Trading Manager of the Capital Group Companies, the home of the American Funds. Capital Group manages more than $1.5 trillion in equity and fixed income assets on behalf of millions of investors um, for institutions and individuals. The Capital Group is an active investment manager who employs fundamental analysis and has a singular focus on delivering superior long-term results to our clients. I also chair the Investment Company Institute's Equity Market Advisory Committee. ICI members are regulated funds, including mutual funds, exchange-traded funds, closed-end funds, unit investment trusts, and uh, its members represent more than 95 million individual investors, retail investors, representing over $19 trillion in assets. My personal experience has been gained, have gained working, I have personal experience which has been gained working in the equity markets for the past 30 years in my career. Regulated funds, such as the funds managed by the capital group, play a critical part in capital formation in the United States. These funds invest in the equity markets on behalf of millions of retail investors saving for their long-term financing goals. We applaud the subcommittee for looking at the state of the equity markets today. I believe we offer a unique perspective on behalf of the millions of clients we serve and our commitment to improving their long-term investment outcomes. Regulated funds are specifically aligned with the objectives of the national market system, that is to serve the interests of long-term investors and listed companies. As an initial matter, I'd like to say that the U.S. equity market is among the fairest, most efficient, and most competitive markets in the world. It allows companies to raise capitals to create jobs, grow their business, and innovate. Key elements of today's equities market structure stem from the 1975 amendments to the Security Exchange Act and Regulation NMS. 
Although this legal framework has contributed to the efficiency of the markets, I believe it's overdue for an inspection. We believe the SEC should lead the efforts to examine and improve equity market structure, while keeping in mind the key objectives of Reg NMS, Reg NMS to serve the interests of long-term investors and listed companies. To that end, the SEC should prioritize reforms that will minimize conflicts of interest and promote transparency in the equity markets. I have made six recommendations in my written testimony, but I will highlight three areas that I think need particular attention. The first is prevalent pricing model in the U.S. equity markets known as maker-taker, which involves charging fees to participants that remove liquidity while paying rebates to those participants who add liquidity. This fee structure results in an inherent conflict of interest, potentially aligning the broker's economic interest against those of their customers. Broker-dealers have an incentive to route client orders in a way that maximizes rebates or minimizes fees, and even if, the results, even if this results in a suboptimal outcome for their customer. The SEC should conduct a pilot program to evaluate how access fees and liquidity rebates affect trading in highly liquid stocks. An effective pilot program would examine whether investors benefit from a market structure with lower access fees, and in particular, zero rebates. NMS plan governance also needs reform. The, plan the plans administer key aspects of market structure and affect all market participants. But they are controlled by self-regulatory organizations that may have conflicts of interest. Other market participants, such as regulated funds, lack any meaningful voice in the plan operations. NMS plan governing bodies would be far better informed and better able to police the conflicts of interest if they included non-SROs, including representative of, regular, of regulated funds. The third area that must be addressed is the lack of transparency that institutional investors have into the order handling activities of broker dealers and the operation of alternative trading systems. Today, stocks trade on roughly four dozen platforms, each with its own set of rules, order types, and unique fee schedule. In this fragmented and complex market structure, the order routing decisions, and by extension, the choice of execution venue, are extremely important to assessing execution quality, reducing information leakage, and improving returns for fund investors. Unfortunately, the, the securities laws provide investors with inadequate information about either broker order handling practices or the operation of ATSs, making it difficult for regulated funds to monitor broker dealers and trading venues. We believe that all institutional investors should have access to detailed information concerning the handling of their orders. Likewise, all market participants should have information about how ATSs operate. The SEC has proposed rules that would greatly enhance transparency in these areas, and we urge the Commission to finalize these rules without delay. The conflicts of interest inherent in maker-taker pricing and the governance of NMS plans and the opacity surrounding broker-dealer order handling practice and ATS operations work to undermine the fairness and integrity of our equity markets. These practices harm long-term investors, including the 95 million Americans who invest in regulated funds. Regulators and market participants should address these, pro these, these issues um, promptly and to modernize equity market structure and to create the market better serving the interests of long-term investors and listed companies. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. The gentleman's time has expired. I should, uh, I should mention as well, uh, which I neglected to do, that your written testimonies will be uh, put into the uh, record without objection as well. And uh, as we are going to be gathering, uh, not everybody is going to agree on these panels uh, either as well, and so we think this is a good uh, time and a good thing to be uh, exploring. So uh, with that, Mr. Saluzzi, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Isenga, Ranking Member Maloney, and the members of the subcommittee. Uh, for giving demonstrating the opportunity to testify on this important topic. We want to applaud the subcommittee for taking the time to examine and question the functioning of our equity market structure, even in this time of relatively low volatility, when complacency can sometimes take hold. We believe the time to be asking tough questions is exactly now, while the market is not under stress as it was in 2008 through 2010. My name is Joseph Saluzzi. I'm a partner and co-founder of Themis Trading. We are a no-conflict institutional agency broker. We do not make markets. We do not trade proprietarily. We do not own a dark pool. Our only business is providing best execution for our institutional clients. We are agents for long-term investors who collectively manage well over a trillion dollars of long-term investor funds. My partner Sal Arnick and I started Themis Trading in 2002 to leverage our expertise in navigating the electronic landscape of trading. In the 90s, we navigated an environment in which regulators tried to rectify many of the pro problematic 
features of market structure at this time. NYSE specialists had engaged in imperfect activity. NASDAQ market makers colluded in keeping bid ask spreads artificially wide. In Themis, we hope to grow a firm that utilized electronic tools to source liquidity for our clients and in the cleanest and natural ways. By the mid-2000s, we recognized that there was a new equity market structure forming with a multitude of ECNs, dark pools, trading venues, which was evolving in especially troubling ways. Complexity was rapidly increasing. A new breed of short-term high-frequency trader was rising, a breed that evolved from many of what you would call were the SOS bandits of yesteryear. These traders were becoming the dominant form of liquidity in our markets with business models built around arbitraging faster and slower quotes on different venues. These firms realized that seconds, milliseconds, and now microseconds mattered, and they realized to capitalize on their proprietary trading arbitrage, they needed the tools which were supplied by the stock exchanges, such as co-location, special order types, proprietary data feeds. I'll try not to get into all the jargon, but there's a lot of it, and the details really do matter here. In our efforts to improve our trading for our clients, we began investigating under the hood how the stock market really worked. We expressed our concerns to our clients, to our regulators, to the industry in general. We also began sharing our concerns publicly. We wrote white papers. We have a Themis trading blog that we run fairly actively now. We're active on social media. In other words, we're not quiet participants in this market structure debate. Our first white paper was titled Toxic Equity Trading. It was written in 2008. It's 2017, right? So we're still talking about this stuff. In 2012, we summarized our findings and published a book called Broken Markets. Well, not quite flash, boys. We didn't sell as many copies. We think the material is very important. Sadly, many of our concerns that we highlighted in the book are still a problem today. Today's stock market is comprised of 13 stock exchanges, 12 active of those 13, 40 alternative trading systems. I won't bore you with all the details. You'll get to those later. But the problem is, is that they're not regulated with the same disclosure and the same practices yardstick. The fragmentation, which escalated after the SEC passed Reg NMS, is the source of most of our problems. While the SEC believed that Reg NMS would create competition among the stock exchanges, we're certain that they did not anticipate that their regulations would have resulted in a high-speed competition to trade against long-term investors. And we hope that the SEC didn't think that all this fragmentation and complexity would be a desired result. And I think most of my panelists and the next panel would agree that what we have right now is not what the SEC <laughs> intended. Our modern markets are built on high-speed races around a fragmented web of liquidity. Our primary concern is how the stock exchanges have changed over time and since they've become for-profit venues. Quite frankly, we think they've lost their way. They are no longer impartial referees, but instead are now players in the game with a vested interest in the outcome. Two exchange practices, which I will get into later, which are particularly harmful, we think, to investors, are one, like Mr. Lyons said, is the make-or-taker rebate model. This is the source of many conflicts of interest. And the second is the proprietary data feeds. And we'll get into that later as well. I see I'm running out of time. Um, our written testimony also covers other main concerns, which include dark pool disclosures, broker order routing disclosures, market maker obligations, payment for order flow for internalizers, the role of academic studies, which needs to be questions, the revolving regulatory door, which needs to be questions. So quite frankly, I've explained a, a lot of issues with our fragmented market structure. It's conflicted, it's complex, and it would be naturally and competitively less so if regulators would act only some common sense reforms. We don't think an entire holistic review is necessary. Things like in, in eliminating payment for order flow and reducing and, re and restricting some of the information that's coming through these proprietary data feeds can go a long way in solving the fragmentation and the complexity that we have. With that, I'd like to thank you and I look forward to answering your questions. Appreciate that. With that, Mr. Rubenstein, uh, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hizanga, Ranking Member Maloney, and distinguished members of the committee. It's a real personal honor for me to be here today to discuss with you these important market structure issues and how we can work together to keep America number one in capital markets and finance. You know, this summer, it'll be 25 years ago that I started as a runner on the floor of the Commodities Exchange at the former World Trade Center, where the biggest piece of technology we had down there at the time was the telephone. It was about a decade later that I felt that technology could evolve our markets in ways that would bring enormous benefits for investors. It was at that point that I helped start my current company, GTS. GTS is an electronic market maker. We provide offers to buy and sell thousands of investment instruments electronically across global markets. All of our trading is quantitatively based and automated using computers. We're also the largest designated market maker, or DMM, at the New York Stock Exchange. 
This means we're uniquely and directly responsible and accountable to over 900 public companies for making sure there is ample liquidity available for their investors throughout the trading day should they need it. That list includes some well-known companies such as ExxonMobil, Berkshire Hathaway, and AT&T. Most recently, we handled the IPO of the technology company Snapchat, which was the largest IPO of the last three years, and raised nearly $4 billion for the company and its workers. Our goal at GTS is to do for the capital markets what Amazon has done for online commerce. Use technology in a responsible way to promote more efficiency for public companies and save their investors money. We do this by adhering to our core principles of transparency and innovation. That yields investor confidence and lower costs. Our efforts help companies navigate the capital markets, raise capital, grow, and employ workers. We've witnessed the capital markets evolve tremendously since the days I was frantically on the floor of the exchange yelling, buying, and selling orders. Like many industries, technology has transformed the business. And just like the conveniences and cost savings we all enjoy using the internet and technology, the financial markets participate in the same way. For example, thanks to some smart regulation and the advanced technology electronic market makers have deployed, the cost to trade has gone down dramatically by more than 50% in the last 10 years alone. According to Vanguard, due to today's reduced trading costs, investments in a mutual fund over a 30-year period will end up with a 30% higher return. There were concerns late last decade that the vulnerability of electronic systems would pose a threat to the markets. The SEC and FINRA enacted rules to address many of these issues. Market access rules, Regulation SCI, the Consolidated Audit Trail are all positive and necessary advancements to our markets. But there's more that needs to be done. The first is we shouldn't squander our resources trying to fix problems that don't exist. I've witnessed a lot of alarms being rang over the, over the last few years for problems that really aren't there, and then to hear solutions which are questionably positive in the grand scheme of things. One example is a recent proposal by one of the national securities exchanges to offer an alternative closing auction for securities listed on other markets. This is creating a little unease for public companies and their investors, which we're all here to serve. Any discussion about market structure ought to include the needs of our public companies. So here's what we should be spending our time on. First, more resiliency to cybersecurity. This is often overlooked in the debate about market structure, but an all electronic market, like many other technology dependent sectors in our economy, needs vigilance on this issue. We need to double down on our efforts to prevent hacking and cyber attacks, and a better system for sharing information between key stakeholders, because we all have a collective interest in preventing such a problem. Next, we need to do more to detect electronic trading fraud and abuse. I'm a member of the FINRA Market Surveillance Advisory Group, whose goal is to assist FINRA in the construction of an advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning system to eradicate nefarious activity in our markets. This is a great and impressive start, but more time and budget is necessary to complete these projects. And finally, we need to further improve the SIP market data feed. Investors need the most accurate information possible when making investment decisions. While investors and market participants have equal access to all publicly available data, the SIP is the most widely used and the least expensive solution. The perception of a SIP feed that operates at a significant disadvantage to direct feeds could eventually drain investor confidence. Our markets are stronger and more efficient than ever, and certainly the envy of the world. But we should not rest on our laurels. Thanks to the hard work of people from the industry and the regulatory bodies, we can deploy these changes from a position of strength. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Isenga, Ranking Member Maloney, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Jeff Brown, and I am Senior Vice President and Head of the Office of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs for the Charles Schwab Corporation. It is my honor today to appear before the subcommittee on behalf of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, other no, otherwise known as SIPMA. SIPMA represents a broad range of financial services firms, including Schwab, that are active in our capital markets and dedicated to making our markets the best in the world. Congress first mandated the establishment of a national market system in 1975. At that time, most equity trading took place manually on the trading floor of an exchange. 
Today's market is fully electronic and automated with a vibrant ecosystem of competing market venues, including more than a dozen exchanges and more than 40 alternative trading systems. Although advances in technology had a major role to play in the evolution of our markets, there have been three major de regulatory developments since 1975 that have created the capital markets of today. First, in 1998, the SEC adopted Reg and ATS, which established regulatory standards for alternative trading systems. The net result of Regulation ATS has been the growth of trading venues that offer varying business models and compete for order flow to the benefit of all investors. Second, in 2001, decimal pricing began after nearly 200 years of a system in which equities traded in fractions. Trading in pennies revolutionized our markets, spurring the rapid growth of electronic trading and increasing liquidity. Finally, in 2005, the SEC adopted Regulation NMS, which was predicated on the need to foster more efficient markets by promoting fair competition while at the same time assuring that the markets were linked together to encourage the interaction of and competition between the orders of buyers and sellers. The centerpiece of Regulation NMS is Rule 611, the Order Protection Rule. Simply stated, the rule was designed to ensure that displayed investor orders cannot be ignored or traded through. Together, these changes, both regulatory and technological, have created markets that are unrecognizable from the markets of 10, 20 years ago. The markets today are highly automated and efficient, providing near instantaneous, low-cost executions. Retail investors, Schwab's clients, and in particular, have benefited from an incredibly competitive and dynamic marketplace. There is one other historical shift that has played an important role in the development of today's market. In the early and mid-2000s, the national securities exchanges began to become for-profit companies instead of broker-dealer-owned utilities. Today, the largest exchanges are owned by publicly traded corporations. As such, they now have a fiduciary duty to deliver profits to their corporate shareholders. This has radically changed the incentives that exist in our capital markets and created conflicts of interest that remain unaddressed. While we understand and appreciate that the, the subcommittee intends to evaluate policy options at a later date, we'd like to highlight two critically important areas that we believe policymakers need to address to, create, to deal with significant inefficiencies. First, we believe that the entire concept of self-regulatory organizations, or SROs, and the national market system plans which they control need to be rethought. SIFMA believes that strong self-regulation must continue to be an integral part of the oversight of our market and its participants. Exchanges, however, continue to act as SROs even though they've become competitors with their former owners. In other words, for-profit companies act as regulators of the very market particip participants with which they directly compete. SROs also manipulate NMS plans to advance their commercial interests at the expense of the industry and the investors they serve. These conflicts of interest are obvious, and we believe Congress or the SEC need to move quickly to rethink the role and responsibilities of the SROs in light of this new reality. Second, we believe the market data system, the way investors receive bids, offers, last sales, and other critical information that is the lifeblood of any effective market, remains locked in a 1970s structure and is in serious need of overhaul. Today, the exchanges offer their own market data streams faster and with far better and deeper information, but it's sharply escalating fees. The consolidated data stream, which the industry must purchase by rule, is slower and contains only ephemeral top-of-book quotes. This structure has returned us to an era when privileged pros get access to better, more timely market information than ordinary investors. This outcome is absolutely contrary to all that has occurred over the last two decades of regulatory and technological development. We urge the SEC or Congress to address this glaring issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to recognize myself uh, for five minutes for, uh, for questionings. Um, and we, we talked about 1975 quite a bit uh, here and what the SEC had done. Um, the uh, question I have uh, regarding Reg NMS, I think, was a, is a big element. And I, I want to direct this to both Mr. Lyons and Mr. Brown very quickly because you are representing larger industry trade groups. Uh, sort of what's the working well the current U.S. equity market structure? Um, what are some areas that can be improved? But I would like to know what consensus really uh, is, uh, does the industry have as a whole? Are there some areas 
that uh, we can address. Mr. Brown, why don't you? <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Uh, what, what's working well, particularly from Schwab's perspective, is the fact that since Reg NMS, and a market structure has evolved that allows retail investors to obtain far better price improvement and, and much better execution quality than exists if they were to flow through to exchanges. And I really believe that as that innovation in itself has been a, a driver in maintaining the U.S. As, the, as, an organ, as a country that has the highest participation of individual investors in the world. And so you're saying a cost of a trade? The cost of trading and the execution quality they receive. Okay. Mr. Lyons, real quickly. <clears throat> so I think um, technolo technology and the regulation environment we work in today has really empowered the buy side, the, the people that I represent and the clients that they uh, work on behalf of, to have more control over the order and the direction of the order that they have. So I think that's a huge benefit. We have automatic access to information. It's much uh, more relevant. So Are you a talking lot of, retail investor or an yeah, institutional we, we, investor? I mean, retail investors. We represent the regulated funds that I speak for represent over 95 million retail investors. Okay. That's really what they are. <clears throat> and so it, it works well, and, and it enables us to efficiently uh, work in the markets. I, I, I think when I tried to, to stress both in my written and my oral testimony that where we fall short is in certain conflicts of interest that exist today, certainly in the broker routing practices and the maker-taker uh, pricing scheme, and also around transparency of broker, those broker order, order routing practices for us to be able to analyze more effectively the quality of the execution we receive from the okay. brokers. Uh, in terms of a consensus, I'm, I'm sorry, in terms of a consensus, quickly. I think that a pilot and the maker-taker is about as close to a consensus that I've ever seen working in the industry. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein, you, you talked about 25 years ago, starting and phone was it. <laughs> um, with technology uh, advancements over the last 40 years from, uh, from 1975, I mean, what, what, what should Congress take a look at uh, statutorily, uh, the statutory framework of equity market structure because of that technology. Look, you're right. I mean, when I was on the floor of the exchange, um, uh, we like to think that we were really efficient down there on the floor, but um, you, know, we, you know, looking at where the markets are now, um, the amount of, of, of intermediation has gone down tremendously, which is why, you know, all of the data suggests that we have the most efficient markets in the world. Um, that are saving retail investors money, institutional investors money, um, helps them save for retirement. So, um, but no surprise, right? Because technology sort of does that. Um, but but it, does that lead to any kind of statutory framework that we ought to be? Looking well, I at? think you know one theme that's coming out of this uh, this hearing already is that while um, we have this great electronic market that is super efficient. Um, I, I think there are areas uh, of, of disclosure and transparency that need to be improved. Um, like if there are pricing schedules that exchanges have with their participants, I think it's, it's, it's really important that brokers that you know, have some sort of agency capacity or in any way need to disclose all of those uh, uh, pricing schedules uh, so investors can make informed decisions. Okay. I've got one minute left, and I've got 20 minutes of questions, unfortunately. Um, and I'd love to get to uh, Mr. Saluzzi doesn't believe a comprehensive review is, uh, is needed. Both Commissioner Pivovar and, and Stein have, have called for comprehensive reviews, but we can address that later. NMS plan governance. Mr. Lyons and Mr. Brown, can you discuss the perceived benefits of allowing broker-dealers and asset managers to have direct voting representation on NMS plan operating committees? If you very quickly each. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that the uh, introduction of brokers and asset managers into the NMS governing committees will certainly broaden the expertise that it, that's brought to bear on a policy issue early in that discussion so that it can be um, pointed in a direction that's better for our markets. Mr. Lyons, real quickly. Yeah, I, I would agree in, in whole part with the suggest, suggestion that non-SRO members um, and the views that they bring, and for us, representing the clients, the 95 million clients that we represent, would bring added benefit to those discussions. And to have a seat at the table would be very meaningful for them. Okay. Um, we, we usually reserve this for the end of the hearing, uh, but uh, we are going to allow for written follow-up questions. You will be receiving a few from me. <laughs> 
uh, as well, things I'd like to get through, and uh, we just ask that uh, the panel um, respond uh, as promptly as possible if, with, with some of those. And with that, uh, the ranking member uh, here for five minutes. Thank you. That was a good set of questions. <laughs> anyway, first of all, this question is for Mr. Saluzzi. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the so-called market uh, taker pricing. Uh, where exchanges pay rebates to brokers who send their orders to the exchange. Uh, uh, some say that this creates a conflict of interest by giving brokers an incentive to send their clients' orders to the exchange that pays them the highest rebate, rather than the exchange that gives them the best execution. The SEC's Equity Market Structure Advisory Committee has recommended that the SEC do a pilot program to test whether market quality improves with lower rebates. Uh, do you think the SEC should go ahead with this pilot uh, program? And if so, who should design the program? The SEC, or, or should they delegate this to the Committee of Exchanges like they did with the tick size pilot program? Thank you, uh, Ranking Member. Certainly not the exchanges. I mean, that's like putting the fox in the hen house, okay? So the answer to that question, I would like the SEC to design a pilot. However, I think the access fee program that's been proposed or been talked about falls short of one critical area. There should be a no rebate, as we call it, bucket. In other words, the source of the problems, the source of what we're talking about when it comes to fragmentation in various venues are the brokers. The brokers are routing at various venues to collect higher rebates. This doesn't make any sense for best execution. Rebates should not be taken into account. So what we think, a better model rather than make or taker, is a flat fee. And actually, there is one exchange currently doing this, IEX, where they charge on their non-displayed liquidity nine mils per share or nine-tenths of a penny, whether you make or take. That collects for them 18 mils, which is a nice revenue capture, if you think about it. Based on the other exchanges, their revenue capture, since they have to pay a rebate and collect an access fee, is closer to three to five mils. So what I'm suggesting is a raise for the exchanges. I think they should deserve more money for matching against buyers and sellers. But rebates are distortive. They're clouding what brokers do. They're putting in unnecessary conflicts of interest. And that's just one part of payment for order flow. There's a second half, which we haven't talked about, and that's where the market makers who are off exchange will buy retail orders from firms like Charles Schwab and others, and they pay for that flow. They pay nine-tenths of a penny, 15 mils, whatever, based on the, the agreement that they have with that broker. We want to know why would a market maker pay for order flow? And they're giving price improvement, as Mr. Brown said. Well, obviously, there's a catch here. Market makers want as much order flow as they possibly can so they can read the direction of the market. But unfortunately, what this does is it corrupts the order routing process from the retail broker side. <clears throat> and I'll give you one example of one that thing that we, we, we really can't believe. There are some firms that can mark a retail order, okay, you can have it identify it going through an exchange, and you can get an enhanced rebate for that exchange. In other words, more money. If you are willing to give up the fact that your client is a retail investor, now what does that mean? Oh, retail only trades 100 shares, it really shouldn't matter, right? No, it does. You know why? Because it's not Mr. Lyon's order, and it's not my order representing an institution, and that means a lot. So what I'm saying is, Rebates, maker-taker, payment for order flow, these are all the sources of conflicts of interest that we've argued against for many years. So we're happy that the SEC has proposed this, but we're un unfortunately, I think it may fall a little short of my suggestion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and Mr. Lyons, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that institutional investors need more and better information about how brokers handle your orders. Uh, the SEC proposed a rule last year that would require brokers to disclose much more information about their clients, about how they handle uh, their orders. And, and your testimony today indicated that you support the SEC's proposed rule with certain uh, modifications. Uh, so, so my question is, uh, what modifications do you believe the SEC should uh, make to the order handling disclosure rule? And, and secondly, what information would you get under the SEC's rule that you currently don't get from your own brokers. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, we do think that this is an important proposal that should be acted on immediately on behalf of our clients. Um, specifically, the modifications have to do with the definition of an institutional order, and we'd really like to make sure that all of our orders are brought in under uh, the program so that we can analyze that data coming back effectively. Um, 
the, the real benefit that we get from the standardized format that has been developed and has really helped developed by the ICI in conjunction with other trade associations, mm -hmm. we gave it to the SEC as a, a, a blueprint, if you will, on how this information could be used, um, is, is it allows us to efficiently process and make apples to apples comparisons across brokers and across venues when it's in a standardized format and in a way that we can easily digest in an electronic format that we can process. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, Mr. Brown, you stated in your testament, oh, oh, excuse me, my time is up. It's such an interesting uh, the, the, project. The, I, I, I think know. we're going to have to have a second round. The, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> sorry, the, the chair sorry. was going to have a very light gavel, so uh, if, the, uh, if the ranking member would like to finish her last question quickly. No, that, that's okay. Okay, all right. Let's respect the time. All right, well, I appreciate okay. that. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, recognize the uh, Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Hulkerin, from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you all for being here. I want to address my first question uh, to you, Mr. Lyons, if I could. Uh, your testimony includes recommendations that ATSs disclose information about their operations and operators. You specifically mentioned preferential access for certain market participants and the potential for conflicts of interest by the operator. I wonder, can you explain why these disclosures should not be voluntary? Uh, can't you elect to use ATSs that disclose the information uh, that you're seeking? Additionally, doesn't Capital Group oftentimes benefit from these unlit trading venues to ex execute large trades? Yeah, another uh, great question. So. I think that the proposal requires a standardized response for the questions that we ask the ATS operators that we interact with today. I mean, we, we go through a, a great deal of scrutiny over our brokers, who they route to, and what venues they expose our orders to. We're very concerned about things like information leakage throughout the process. And so there are benefits to ATSs that are unlit. Mostly those accrue to us in large block um, transactions. Um, but in order to engage in a meaningful discussion so that our clients are, are better served as they interact with all these different ATSs, it's important for us to have information about how they operate. Um, and I don't think that disclosing ATS operations is any more of a burden than what the SROs do today. And I think in today's market, where they're really effectively competing with each other, is why, why do we need to have separate standards of disclosure between ATSs and exchanges anymore. I think you touched on this a little bit in your answer there, but uh, just to drill a little deeper, uh, can you explain how uh, this interacts with your recommendations for requiring broker dealers to provide institutional investors with more granular disclosure about order routing activities and uh, more specifically, what information should this include? So the real important aspect of the proposal for the order handling disclosure rule is for us to be able to get more detailed information, not only about where our executions are taking place, which we get pretty readily, and it's available through the technology enabled in the markets, but really how much of our orders are being routed and where they're being routed, and are the, are the routes consistent with the success we get with actual executions? And those are the missing components that we don't get in a real digestible format today that we could really use. Thanks. Mr. Rubenstein, if I could uh, address uh to you, I appreciated uh, the section of your written testimony discussing cybersecurity. I don't know that this qualifies as market, market structure, but it certainly is important to market integrity and to investor confidence. Uh, you recommend establishing a better system for sharing information between key stakeholders. Wondered if you could please explain the system that's currently in place and what specific changes you would recommend and what role the SEC or SROs should or do play in this system. Thank you, Congressman. Well, right now, um, uh, as a member of FINRA, uh, we're frequently audited and, and, and we have to abide by the rules that FINRA has. And they have a lot of rules regarding uh, cybersecurity that firms have to maintain uh, adequate safeguards to prevent hacking um, and, order, and other types of cyber theft. But um, because of the, of the sensitive nature of, of cyber issues, um, the, the industry, I feel, has been really hesitant in in banding together and sharing sensitive information. Like when one firm has to deal with a cyber issue, they learn something. That information needs to be shared with uh, other stakeholders in the industry. So that would be my suggestion is that, that um, uh, folks in the industry uh, get together and we actually mandate that they get together and have this discussion so obstacles that are encountered can be lessons learned for everybody else. Thanks. 
A couple of you have mentioned in your testimony that the ICC should uh, renew its Equity Market Structure Advisory Committee. I've generally received positive feedback regarding the work of the committee, uh, but uh, as is the theme of the hearing today, I wonder if there are opportunities uh, that we can find improvement there as well. Uh, Mr. Brown, I wonder if I could address the uh, last couple questions to you. Do you believe that MSAC is the proper representation of market participants and policy experts? And uh, do you believe MSEC's work and recommendations are being uh, made use of in a constructive fashion? Well, thank you, Congressman. The um MSAC is a valuable tool for the SEC to, to, to probe the issues that uh, confront it. I'll have to say that uh, we were disappointed uh, in the original makeup of the MSAC because we felt that a, re a firm that served retail investors was not included in the, uh, in the makeup of the committee. As well, uh, we joined with uh, two of the largest exchanges to write a letter to the SEC urging them to, you know, to make modifications because we felt that that was, a, a, was something that uh, could really add to the benefit of, of the MSAC. So I would hope as they look at that makeup coming for, you know, as it expires in August and may get reconstituted, uh, they would consider that a retail firm and the listing exchange would be included. Thank you all. Again, I have many more questions, but uh, we've got limited time. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, with that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you very much. And to begin with, Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you and congratulate you on putting together this, this hearing uh, with these two panels. Uh, this is really an all-star group, and I, I really appreciate, appreciate your good work and, and the good work of uh, Ranking Member Maloney. Uh, Mr. Saluzzi, I know that you've been working on a lot of issues to democratize the markets and uh, yourself and, and your business partner, uh, Joe Sarnik, over at uh, Themis, has, they've been doing a great job. Uh, the, the essence of a properly functioning market uh, includes uh, a pricing mechanism so that uh, when, when prices fall too far, there'll be new buyers coming into the market and, and it reestablishes a, an accurate equilibrium. But, but what you've described in, in your book, and I actually read Broken Markets, thank you very much, uh, uh, and, and also to Mr. Arnick, uh, when you put things in like the maker-taker uh, incentives, the rebates that are, that are going on there, uh, co-location that uh, Mr. Lewis described in his book, uh, also uh, you know, payment for order flow and uh, special order types, all of that is an encumbrance on, on a properly functioning market. Now, uh, last, last session I sponsored the Maker-Taker Conflict of Interest Reform Act, uh, and uh, I know I sent it over to Mr. Arnick. I'm not sure if you got a copy as well, but uh, the legislation would require the SEC to carry out a pilot program, such as Mr. Lyons has suggested, and I think Mr. Brown has mentioned, uh, to create an alternative to the maker-taking pricing model and, and see what happens. Just take, you know, take a group of stocks uh, and uh, have, have remo remove the incentives other than uh, the best price for the customer. Uh, uh, did you have a chance to review that at all or, or uh, have any thoughts on that? Congressman, thank you, and yes, I did, and thank you for introducing that bill. I think you were before the MSACS committee on, on their proposal. Yours was 2015, I believe. So that's exactly what we're talking about. However, we are, we are afraid of unnecessary complexity, again, seeping into the market, and some of them on the MSAC are proposing multiple buckets, they call it, in these, tick, in these pilots, similar to what we have in the tick size pilot. That's where more complexity starts to breed. I, I think we can do something when it comes to rebates and make or taker in, in a more simpler form, as I, as I mentioned earlier, with a flat take-take fee. But, but you also mentioned a couple of other really good points when it comes to order types, proprietary data feeds. You know, this whole maze and this whole web that we're describing, you know, we referred to it as a Rube Goldberg machine years ago. And, you know, the order, here's the buyer and here's the seller. They should be really easy to match up. But instead, they have to go through this crazy mechanism called the United States stock market. We can match up buyers and sellers. We need less intermediation. And what we have now is more intermediation. And we think it's unnecessary. Some of these things which causes more intermediation are these order types. Let's, let's just take that for instance. A special, for instance, one of the exchanges a couple of years back was fined $14 million because they did not display or did not disclose certain order types behavior. $14 million is a significant fine by the SEC to a United States Stock Exchange. The reason being is that some clients can take advantage of those order types, while others can't. 
So it just, and I don't want to get into the weeds too, too detailed, but I wanted to read you know, one quote. There was something that NASDAQ recently had out called the post only order, okay? That, that order is, they, they changed the way they basically designed it. It's supposed to not interact with a, a current hidden order. So you can place a hidden order, you can place a, a displayed order. Why would they do that? Because they don't want to incur the access fee. So NASDAQ recently changed it and said, you know what, actually, we were giving away information on those hidden orders because the post only would slide down when it ran into a hidden order. Was that by design or by accident? I don't know. But for seven years, that went on. Information leakage in the order types through the proprietary data feeds was going on. And this is what causes problems in the United States stock market. These right. are the issues that are really in depth. All right. Thank you for that explanation. I wanted to talk a little bit about dark pools. And uh, we recently had a case uh, this year, uh, January 2017, where uh, the high-frequency trading firm Citadel was fined by the SEC about 22 million bucks for uh, misleading brokers who sent them retail, retail orders. And uh, Citadel had promised to give them the best price. Instead, they, they referred the, uh, the, the trades to dark pools, and it turned out they weren't getting the best price uh, for their clients. What's the best way to uh, introduce some uh, transparency uh, to, to the, the dark pool situation? Well, again, that situation was based on two sets of data, right? There, there's one set which is run by the SIP, or the security information processor. Right. That's the and slow feed, right? That's the slow feed. Yeah. And then there's the other fast feed. That's the direct feeds that anybody can purchase from an exchange and then co basically consolidate them all to build a faster quote. So the Citadel case was basically they were seeing one quote and giving the client a fill on an inferior quote. What's interesting about that is they pay for that order flow again. Right, like we talked about before. But if you go back to 2004, Citadel actually wrote a comment letter urging the SEC to ban payment for order flow. They said it distorts order routing decisions, anti-competitive, and creates an obvious conflict of interest. Right. Well, what changed in the last 13 years that now makes it acceptable? Right. Gentleman's time has expired. I thank the chairman for his courtesy. Appreciate that. Gentleman's time has expired. A uh, gentlewoman from uh, Missouri. Ms. Wagner thank is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for appearing today to discuss issues relating to uh, equity market structure and developments that have come about over recent years due to technological advancement and regulation. As many of you all have said, the U.S. equity market is indeed the most efficient and the most competitive in the world, allowing companies to raise capital to create jobs and grow their business. Uh, additionally, improvements in market structure have made it easier for what I would call ordinary investors uh, to access the market and trade, uh, which is something I'd like to first uh, start with, uh, Mr. Lyons and uh, also Mr. Brown. In what ways have both institutional and retail customers benefited uh, from advancements in U.S. equity market structure? Mr. Lyons. Yeah, uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, you know, again, uh, as, I, as I said before, certainly um, with Reg NMS, there was a lot of friction taken out of the system around uh, access to the markets in uh, real time, which was an important point of Reg NMS going into. So it allows us as a buy side trader representing the interests of our 95 million clients um, that the regulated funds actually have interest in, it allows us more control over the, over the order process and allows us to get better outcomes for our investors. Um, you know, the U.S. equity markets are as liquid as any markets we, or more liquid than any markets we trade in. My vantage point in trading around the globe and every single market around the world, um, we see really favorable outcomes for our investors transacting in the U.S. markets. Mr. Brown? Yeah. You, yeah. I think we have to go back to the context of when NMS was created. Remember, at that point, we still had manual market. The New York Stock Exchange operated manually. It took mm -hmm. minutes to understand mm -hmm. where you're trading. So there's no question that retail investors in the 12 years that have, that have elapsed have, have now have instantaneous access you know, at executions between the spread. So there are tremendous advancements there that have inured to the benefit well, of- to that point, Mr. Brown, I, the, are indeed, I guess, the increased levels of trading automation and faster uh, execution speeds over the last decade, are they attributable, attributable to regulation NMS? 
I wouldn't necessarily say that they're attributable solely to NMS. You know, technology has mm -hmm. improved. Um, the use of algorithmic trading has developed, and it has been allowed for innovative approaches to trading that has really created uh, these deep, liquid, and, and best markets in the world. And in, in, in addition um, to the, the innovation and the access for the retail investors, um, have investors benefited, would, would you say, or been harmed by these developments? What would be um, uh, your assessment? There's no question. I think one of the comments earlier was about what, where we have consensus. I don't think anyone would argue that retail investors have it the best they've ever had it at this time. And because of the way the markets have developed, Okay, and, and one of your big concerns has to do with this, the, the market data system um, that is uh, well, decades that, and decades old. Would you care to expound a little yeah, bit? Yeah, you know, now you've touched on a subject that where there is a concern. <laughs> we right. have uh, an antiquated structure that governs the, the market data system. We have a securities information process, there's really two of them, that uh, produce a, a slower data feed than what is available professionally and through the proprietary uh, uh, data feeds from the exchanges. Those are too expensive to be able to show our retail clients, so we, and we're required by rule to purchase the market data from the SIPs. Mm. Now, it's an interesting d dynamic because it's like having a business where the broker dealers have to give the raw materials to a company by rule, and then by rule we have to buy back the finished product. That's a great business if you could be in it. You, you, would, you have guaranteed uh, profits, but that has to change. It's time to modernize our market data system. All right, great. Uh, switching quickly here to how equity market structure affects capital formation, can you describe how market structure impacts capital formation and does the current structure impede or facilitate capital formation? Well, that's it. again. There's a complex subject. The you've got seven yeah, the, yeah, seconds, and Mr. Brown. <laughs> it's a very complex subject. I would just simply the regulatory scheme that overrides corporation in making a decision: Do I want to become public? Is really an impediment to mm -hmm. our, the growth of uh, new corporations, new public companies. Sadly, my time has. Uh has lapsed. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I look forward to submitting the rest of my questions uh, in writing. Thank you so much. Is the difficulty of the format all in five minutes? So it's a challenge. So, uh, with that, the Chair recognizes Mr. Foster of Illinois for five minutes. Uh, thank you, um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this. Um, the, uh, Mr. Brown, you, you uh, mentioned uh, SIP technology improvements. Uh, are there, is there any reason that this should not be pursued really aggressively? For example, are the HFTs unlikely to use the SIP in any case because they prefer the proprietary? Who would be against a rather aggressive improvement in, in SIP technology? I think you'll hear in the next panel that they'll say that SIP improvements have been made. But why was that? Because the SIPs failed. And when the SIPs fail, all trading ceases. Well, that's a real problem. Now, how long before the SIP fails again, I mean, I don't know, but the fact is exchanges and the, and the members of the NMS plan governing committee that oversees the SIP are never going to make the SIP so good that it would cannibalize their proprietary data fees which they sell. I mean, there's a conflict. You, how would you ever, why would you ever do that? So it will always remain a, a, a second tier product. Now, it can be improved dramatically. You could add depth of book to the, to the public feed. We have to buy it. Why wouldn't we be allowed to see multiple levels of data within that public feed? I think that's an important improvement. And it has been, the latency has been narrowed, but it could probably be narrowed further. So all in all, I would recommend it be pursued further. I think your question is right on, sir. Okay. Uh, now, there are two very impressive uh, facts that have been quoted here, the, the Vanguard number of the 30% increase in your value at retirement for your typical mutual fund. Uh, is that really a widely accepted? It's been a real improvement from the point of view of the long term. Um, so no one would take issue with that. Uh, the other one is that the, at the other corner, there's sort of the ma and pa trader who have been obviously getting a much better deal. Um, and that is, at least in part, I understand, affected by the payment for order flow. That, that, and is it 
a correct understanding of mine that actually Mon Pa traders get a better deal because people are willing to pay for their order flow? Or is there some asterisks on that statement? No, that's pretty accurate because Mon Pa trades, trades from retail investors, have an inherent value. There is less risk associated with them because sure. there's, there's not a hundred thousand. You, know, you know, you don't have Jim Simons on the other end of yeah. the right? Yeah. So th there's less risk. So a trader will be willing to um, provide a payment for order flow in order to attract those types of orders. Now, in so doing, and like the courts and the SEC have recognized that a firm that sends order flow to a, in return for payment has an obligation. One, you have to make sure that you disclose all the payments you're receiving. And then secondly, you have to use, ensure that you obtain best execution. Best execution can be measured by execution quality, and that's what we do at Schwab. It's really critical for us. And so our clients, on average, receive a quarter of the spread in price improvement versus if the same size order were sent to an exchange on average, they would get disimprovement. It would be traded outside the spread. So we, we believe there's no question that that is best execution, and so do the regulators. Now, I think that um, further disclosure is a good idea. Maybe there are ways to make it plain English so clients would understand better what's going on. But I think overall, we're fully supportive of that system. Any other comments on If I may. Yeah, this was okay. Go ahead. I, I think that's interesting what Mr. Brown says, but all of his orders are being sold to various market makers, including limit orders, which I don't understand why a non-marketable limit order would be sold to a market maker when it could be posted on an exchange, but that's a different point. But the Citadel case that we described before shows that there are two sets of data. So not every time does mom and pop get in the right set of data. In other words, that SIP quote that they're looking to buy at the market may not be getting what they're the price that they're getting. But that's just one point. The second point is, you know, retail, we all talk about it, and I agree, 100 shares of, you want to buy at and No problem. Put it through your uh, retail account, you'll be fine. But retail also represents, you know, if everyone has a pension fund or a 401k, or I have a 529 for my kids, I've been saving for the college for the last 15 years. Well, that money is an institutional level. So that means I am a retail investor being represented by an institution, so I don't think we have to just say retail's never had it better. How is it that the institutions are doing, and I think Mr. Lyons explained quite a bit of a, of a conflict when it comes to order routing and, and, and various other things going on in the market. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add um, one, one comment, and that's the um, premise that Vanguard has made in regards to their results um, in response to Reg NMS. For the capital group, which is who I work for, as we've looked at our transaction costs, implicit transaction costs, explicit costs have come down certainly, um, but implicit costs haven't really come down as much as people would have suggested from our own data. Um, <clears throat> and specifically, when we look at the data, we attribute more of the reduction in explicit costs to decimalization, um, certainly, that happened, and also an increased electronic uh, access to the marketplace, which is a lower price. Um, way to access. All right, thank you, and my time is up. Uh, the uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate this uh, first panel, and it just makes me always, when we talk about this subject, I always feel old because one of my first jobs uh, in the uh, a brokerage uh, company in the 1970s was typing confirmations using carbon paper, and I'll, I'll explain to the staff what carbon paper is uh, after, after the hearing. Uh, so we've gone from, you know, member-owned cooperative exchanges now to for-profit uh, exchanges and, uh, and these alternative trading venues, and I've really enjoyed listening to the discussion. <laughs> Uh, but one thing that I think there's been a lot of discussion in Congress on and at the SEC, but no change in the last few years is this issue of governance now, you know, of, of, the, uh, of the market. So, uh, Mr. Lyons and Mr. Brown, could you tell me, talk a little bit about the, the, the benefits of having asset managers or uh, broker dealers, people from the brokerage community serving in the governance uh, model overseeing NMS? Yeah, so I, I think that having representation of the millions of people that we have our best interest uh, aligned with is uh, additive to the process. And I think specifically, as an example that was just brought up, is a conflict of interest in, for instance, the SIP um, operating committee. And I, and I think that 
when you have for-profit exchanges who are controlling the pricing mechanism around the SIP and there's no disclosure at all around how those revenues are spent, how they're allocated, what the investment in technology is, I think that that's a perfect example of having someone outside of the SROs onto these governance plans would add a level of um, transparency that would help along the process and maybe uh, inhibit some of the conflicts. And uh, Mr. Brown, when you were talking about uh, market data and you talked about modernization, could you kind of go deeper and step away from the buzzword and tell me specifically what you mean by modernization? What, do, what does that mean to you? Well, with respect to market data, it would mean changes to the feeds that would allow for um, more information to be available to public investors, retail investors. You know, as I mentioned, uh, the adding depth of book to the SIP fee would be a, a, a change. And you know, this isn't something that's new. We've been advocating for this for many years. And in fact, I was reading one of the Reg NMS adopting releases, and, and I'm quoted in there talking about how the market data system needs to be repaired. You know, it kind of shows you how long I've been talking about the same things with uh, little effect. But um, what I really would say is that the system as structured, and it really goes back to a, a structure created in the 1970s, it locks us into a certain system. There's no innovation. There, you know, the innovation has occurred outside of the SIP. The proprietary data feeds are much faster, much more in depth, and they're very effective in providing information. But if we're going to have to have a, a public feed that the industry has to purchase, it ought to be maintained it, it, at higher levels, and, that is, and that's not the case. And I'm also interested, you know, we, we've had a lot of conversations since I've been in Congress about uh, ETFs, and in fact, public policy has, uh, uh, I'd argue, uh, you know, encouraged people to ETFs as if they are superior to any other decision that an individual investor might make about asset allocation. And clearly, uh, one of the concerns, as Mr. Lyons talked about, is uh, uh, the impact on retail investors who invest through a collective, you know, process. So could somebody reflect, uh, talk a little bit, maybe Mr. Rubenstein, talk about uh, the impact of uh, these challenges on governance and NMS and uh, the impact on the ETF market, exchange-traded fund market? Thank you, Congressman. Well, certainly ETFs um, bring enormous efficiencies to all types of investors, both retail and institutional. Um, however, uh, th th there's been such a huge adoption recently of ETFs, um, and, and we've seen a tremendous rotation from some more actively managed portfolios to passively managed portfolios that involve ETFs. But um, um, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of volatility in the market since this rotation has happened. So in some ways, the, the markets are a bit untested. Um, given all of the amount of assets that have gone into the ETFs, and it's, it's definitely something that we should talk about uh, to make sure that industry participants are, are prepared for potential volatility in those instruments. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just think this is a, a really an accident waiting to happen with the way we are driving people through public policy decisions to uh, ETFs as if it's a, a sanctuary of, of low risk and unlimited upside. So I yield back. Thank you. Jamal yields back. Uh, with that, the uh, chair uh, recognizes uh, Mr. Scott of Georgia for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Our equity, equity market structures uh, played such a very pivotal role in our total economy. Um, and I think it is important to establish that our capital markets of the United States um, is the greatest in terms of competitive advantages to the world. Trust in our markets to work effectively is what attracts investments from across the world to the United States. I, I want to repeat that. Trust in our markets to work effectively is what attracts investments from across the world to the United States. This is what makes our nation number one. 
And I think that's why this hearing here today is so important to study the evolution of our equity market structure and to search out and get recommendation from you panelists and this committee, how we can all work together to improve it. Um, and this is indeed a complex subject matter. Um, and everyone basically wants a fairer, more transparent, open market. But we want this because improved markets results in better execution of trades. And better execution of trades means better prices, which saves money for the everyday people. So keeping that in mind, um, to our American people who may be watching this hearing, to those who are saving money for retirement or saving for the down payment to buy a house, I simply want to ask this panel how Congress should prioritize any changes to the market structure. I'll take uh, one to go down the line. Uh, what I'm asking for here is, it's important for us to keep our nation strong, to keep our nation's financial system strong, to keep us number one. And, and the fundamental question is, because you all are very distinguished, what can you tell us as members of Congress that we need to do to keep our nation strong and having the strongest financial economic system on the planet. Mr. Lyons. Yes, Mr. Scott, thank you. Um, I think that importantly, um, the Congress can encourage the SEC to continue down the road of looking to create opportunities for our system to be even better. I do agree that we have the most fairest, most efficient, most liquid, most competitive markets in the world, and I think it serves our economy and our, our citizenry very well. However, as I've explained, there are conflicts of interest in the market that we think can be addressed, and we'd really like and hope that the Congress can push the SEC to address some of those conflicts as we've described earlier. We also think that the proposals that the SEC has made over broker disclosure routing and ATSs are an important component for regulated funds like ourselves to monitor and evaluate the execution quality we get on behalf of our clients, which lead mm -hmm. to better investment outcomes, as you suggest. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman. Yes. Uh, I, I can't agree with you more that, that trust and confidence in our markets are, are the most important thing we need. Uh, an old friend of ours, Senator Kaufman, used to always say fairness and transparency is the, is the key here. And, and I agree. And what doesn't give me trust and confidence is that when I see you know, major dark pools or ATSs getting fined multi-million dollars, when I see a stock exchange getting fined millions of dollars for various behaviors, or certain high-frequency trading firms also getting fined. So I think what's missing here, a critical link, is proper surveillance. And that goes back, back to the SEC. And, and in, in, in an attempt to fix that, they have recommended the consolidated audit trail, which is now being built, but it's, it falls short in one key area. It only covers the stock and options market. It doesn't cover the futures market because that's the CFTC. They need to talk to each other. Absolutely, and w w uh, uh, something that I'm not sure we're, uh, the people watching us this morning is quite aware, but I think that I want to bring to the attention of this committee that according to information that I have received, trading at traditional national venues like the New York Stock Exchange has gone down. That worries me. Um, I see my time is up. If I can, a real quick stat. Prior to NMS, 80% of share was done at the New York Stock Exchange of their yeah. listed stocks. Now it's less than 25 because of the fragmented maze of liquidity that's been created, partly, mostly due to the Greg NMS. Yeah, thank you, sir. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, with that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to thank Chair Heizenga. Zenga for calling this uh, important hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. I, I try not to cover uh, the same ground, but I do have some questions uh, that relate to some of the things that you've been testifying to this morning. Uh, first, Mr. Lyons, uh, in your uh, uh, opening statement, 
I, I wrote it down. You said our equity markets are fair and the most efficient in the world. But then you went uh, at the end of your testimony and said there are three areas that we really need to be concentrating on. The maker-taker, self-regulatory reform, the SROs, lack of transparency of broker-dealers in uh, ATS. Uh, it was all about conflicts of interest. And uh, I think that seemed to be a theme that developed uh, on the panel. Mr. Brown, you also talked about that uh, in your opening statement. And I guess uh, the question I'd like to open with uh, is for you, Mr. Lyons, and I, I might uh, spread it down the row. Can you give us an example, a specific example of the conflict of interest that you're talking about? And I, any one of the uh, three examples that you've given or the three areas, it would be helpful. So we do a lot of analysis on <clears throat> how, our bro how our orders are exposed to the marketplace. Again, as someone who works for an active manager who spends an enormous amount of resources doing fundamental analysis, trying to uncover hidden value for our investors, how we implement those decisions in the marketplace are paramount to them receiving the benefits of that work we do and to maximize the returns that they can get. Um, as we traverse the complex marketplace we have today, it's important for us to understand who sees our orders, where information leakage might be happening, how ATS is operating in an environment. So, you know, when we look at the results of our analysis, we have questions for the broker dealers that we do business with specifically. You know, why are we routing to this venue that seems like we don't get very much volume into? Or I see that my um, execution quality on one exchange that charges a maker-taker fee might be widely different from another exchange that charges an inverted maker-taker fee. So bringing to bear the reasons that people are routing the way they do is an important aspect of what we do, and that's why I think disclosure um, is a good way to kind of get over, get over that potential conflict that they have. Mr. Brown, do you have anything that you would add to that? Any specific examples? You know, we've, we've heard this morning about payment for order flow. You know, clearly that's a potential conflict. And it's one that at Schwab we look at very closely because, and we then take steps to mitigate that conflict. For example, our execution partners, we require them to charge us the same, or to pay us the same amount, you know, per order. We don't want them, we don't want to have any incentive to route to one or another based on a higher payment. That just doesn't happen. And then secondly, we really monitor our execution quality so that we can be certain that our clients receive uh, best execution when they're getting an execution from one of these vendors. Because otherwise, we would be in, our conflict would be insurmountable. But that's not the case. For example, in the first two quarters of this year, our clients have earned $70 million in price improvement through this structure, whereas the payment for order flow is about $7 million. And so, you can see, and those are just market orders. So the, the fact is that you know, we really do believe that this is a better system. And that payment for order flow is then reinvested back into right. our business to give our, our trading tools, to give our clients better trading tools, better services, better systems, and ultimately lower commissions so that they can trade. Just so you know, as we go forward, people like me, we're going to need more specific examples because both of you have just told me the way I heard it, how you are self-policing. You are seeing these issues and you try to address them in the marketplace. And I don't know that if that's happening, we need to know where and what policy will help, uh, help drive better results. Mr. Saluzzi, uh, very quickly, because I have a short uh, amount of time, I, and maybe I'll send this to you later, because I want to ask uh, uh, Mr. Rubenstein something about uh, SIP fees uh, versus direct fees in the 20 seconds I have left, but uh, you said we should be questioning the role of academic study, and maybe you and I can connect after and talk about that. Uh, SIP fees versus direct fees quickly, Mr. Rubenstein. It's extremely important that uh, we have investor confidence. That's why we're all here in this room today. Uh, investors use the SIP feed because it's the least expensive option. The SIP has improved dramatically in the last few years, but there's more work to be done. There are a lot of uh, proposals on how we can make it even more accurate. And maybe and I I'm going to consider that. I, I see my time's expired. Yeah, maybe so. I'm going to have to follow up with you as well. My after pleasure. The Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, with that, we go to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our panel. I really appreciate your uh, written testimony as well as the comments you were able to provide. Uh, very good insights into this situation. Uh, one area that I didn't get a lot of uh, reference to, I hear a lot of reference to liquidity, uh, specifically a lot of reference to liquidity, talking about high frequency traders or this dispersion of exchanges. Um, one of the things, and I'd like if you could each comment briefly about the challenge for liquidity for small cap firms. Liquidity for companies like Apple or AT&T, you know, no, no, no problem. But companies that are trying to enter uh, public, publicly traded uh, ways to grow, which is part of how our country really built and thrived, was helping entrepreneurs scale their companies in, and uh, stay in control of them at some level uh, versus selling out to private equity or just the other parts of the M&A market. This path seems to almost be closed. We've added to it with lots of regulatory burden, but this dynamic of liquidity, if you could comment on. I, uh, thank you, Congressman. I think it's an excellent question, and I think it goes to the heart of the tick size pilot that has been approved and is currently implemented. All stocks are not equal, and, and this is a very important point. You know, it's not a one-size-fits-all market. So you may have a small-cap company that's doing great and they're growing and so on, but they, they don't fall under the radar of a large investment manager. So they're trying to get their self known, and maybe they're looking for analysts to cover them, but nobody wants to make a market in that stock anymore because it's not profitable. So the tick size pilot came out and said, how about if we widen the tick to a nickel and to see if we can encourage real liquidity providers to come in to support the name? Now, now the, the, the facts are still not known on the tick size pilot. As much as the industry wants to say it's a failure, I don't believe that's true. I think it's starting to work, but what's happening is you have to change behavior amongst traders like myself, which we've adopted to it very easily, but there are a lot of broker algorithms. So most people, I'm a dinosaur in the sense that we're still trading. I'm still a human covering accounts. When I'm not here, I'm hitting keys at my desk. I am a practitioner. But what happens is there's a lot of algorithms out there, and they haven't figured out that you can go in there for more size. There may be more liquidity. Instead, what they do, the average trade size in the United States, which trades six to seven billion shares a day, is 200 shares. That's lit or dark. So that's a very small amount. What needs to happen is behavior will change, and I think it will, and it will prove that the tick size pilot could help those small cap companies. Thank you, Mr. Saluzzi. Mr. Rubenstein. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I'm glad you brought this subject up because uh, the number of IPOs has gone down tremendously uh, in this country um, over the last 10 years and 20 years. Um, certainly uh, increasing the amount of liquidity for small and mid-cap companies um, would help and, and uh, it'll be interesting to see the results of the tick pilot. But when we're also, you know, there, there was a theme in this room talking about uh, the maker-taker maker -taker pricing schedule. And, you know, we're all for, you know, taking a look at, at the data-driven approach to see how, how we can make our markets more efficient. But the fact of the matter is, if you remove rebates from the market, you will remove liquidity for small and mid-cap companies. You will remove lit liquidity in the markets. So if we, if we start attacking the maker-taker pricing schedule, um, it will run contra to the tick pilot program. The other thing that we have to keep in mind, if we're trying to increase liquidity in small and mid-cap names, is making sure the close, the, 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 the closing auction remains centralized at the primary exchanges. There's talk now of fracturing that close. And you know, public companies have spoken out, and they have said that, especially small and mid-cap companies, that they want their close um, affected by the primary listed venue, and we should pay attention to them. Thank you. I, I'd like to change topics. I apologize for cutting off, but uh, time runs fast on this thing. So um, a lot of talk on this consolidated auto trail, Mr. Saluzzi, uh, probably most acutely. But one of the things that strikes me is, is these exchanges are, are selling data. Um, they have the data. Uh, there's a whole commodity market for it, effectively. Uh, isn't this the exact same data that we're trying to get from the consolidated audit trail? Mr. Congress, Brown? Yeah, Congressman, you're absolutely right. That's one of the troubling things about not having broker-dealer participation in an NMS plan developing the consolidated audit trail is that what is going to be the use of that information once it resides within the uh, within the exchanges. Are they going, you know, it is for regulatory purposes, but will it be used for business purposes? We have no confidence whatsoever that that isn't the case, and we won't know until this rolls out. So it is a, a real concern. I thank you all. My time has nearly expired. I really look forward, into digging, look forward to digging deeper into the topics. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
Chairman yields back. With that, uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Hollingsworth of Indiana for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the uh, distinguished panelists for being here this morning. I've really enjoyed and appreciated the dialogue. I wanted to ask Mr. Brown a question, something that you said uh, earlier I wanted to come back to. You had mentioned that in routing to an exchange, all too frequently the quality of execution declines dramatically as opposed to maybe other methods by which you would fulfill that order. Um, and I think you mentioned specifically it being outside the, bay, the spread, when on occasion you can make up some of the spread by routing it differently. Tell me a little bit about that and why there's such a discrepancy between quality of execution. Well, the whole execution structure that, that has developed mm -hmm. since Reg NMS is, is one that's recognizing that the less risk of a retail order. Yeah. And so firms compete aggressively to attract those orders in order to trade against them, and, and then they can make some profit. The client gets a tremendous execution right. over a quarter of the spread on average, and we get a payment for order flow. If you turn, that, that value doesn't go, you could eliminate payment for order flow, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't change our routing practices because they still are going to be competing and trying to utilize the inherent value in a retail order. If you send it to an exchange, who sits at the bid offer and exchange? Professional traders. They're going to benefit. Are they going to, the exchanges don't want to compete you know, by driving to a better price, they would rather be able to keep their bid offer and, and, and allow the, the retail customer to really pay more, transfer wealth from retail investors to the professional. Right. That just doesn't make sense in our view. Right, and ha how have you, maybe over the course of your career, but maybe even more recently in the last decade, how has the delta in exchange, or excuse me, in execution quality between exchanges and other order routing or order fulfillment, tell me, how has that changed over time? Has it gotten narrower or has it gotten larger or has it stayed roughly the same? And if so, what's driving that in either direction? Well, I would argue it is widening. Okay. And it's because the internalizers, so to speak, who are our execution partners, are competing aggressively to attract flow. Mm -hmm. And it's a... And what's keeping the exchanges from trying to compete with them to do Well, they that? have come up with ideas. They, yeah. There was an idea on the New York Stock Exchange to have a, the, a midpoint execution. Mm -hmm. And um, yet, when you seek it out, you may not, it may not be there. And then you, it's too late. You, you're going to trade on the bidder offer. So the, there, are, there should be competitive reactions by the exchanges. Right rather than an example of something like trade at, yeah. which trade at is a, a watchword for, let's force by regulation order flow back to the exchanges. Yeah. Let's use regulation, rather than competing on price, let's use regulation to compete. And we really take exception to that. Well, I know you've talked a lot about data and some of the proprietary feeds that come from the exchanges and the, some of the concerns that I think have been expressed by everybody about um, the, the control that they have over that. We, would you say that the lack of narrowing in execution quality is reflective of the lack of competition that exchanges are being pressured with as opposed to the other order routing methods? Well, certainly there is a pressure on them mm -hmm. because, as Mr. Sluzy mentioned, you know, the New York Stock Exchange volume went from 80% of their listed securities into the mid-20s. And so they want to do something to drive that back. You know, and if they can't do it by competing on price, they'll yeah. do it through regulation. Right. Fair enough. Mr. Rubenstein, you had talked a little bit earlier, and I know uh, previous congressman touched on this, but just to come back to it, what do you hear from large public companies, from investors, or from pre-IPO companies about their specific concerns with regard to market structure and how that might impact the liquidity in their trading, in their stock, how it might impact their IPO? Kind of tell me a little bit. So we've talked a lot about the decline in IPOs, the decline in number of public companies. There's a lot of reasons for that, many of which are discussed in this committee. But what specifically about market structure concerns people? Well, I think there are three items. Thank you, yeah. uh, Congressman. Uh, the first is the, they certainly recognize um, how innovative technologies have made the markets more efficient. Mm -hmm. They made them more fair, more yeah. transparent. Uh, we're saving investors money uh, when they trade, as, as we've heard is a big theme today. Yeah. Um, they're also uh, interested in, in understanding the markets better, and, mm -hmm. and you know we're happy to use some of the quantitative tools that, that, that we use to um, build our trading algorithms uh, and help them uh, understand the markets with those tools. Right. And, and the third thing is, you know, one thing that, that, that has come back is 
by, by far the most important thing to them mm -hmm. is that their closing auction, as, right. as I mentioned briefly earlier, is conducted by their primary listed yes. uh, venue. Uh, it's the most important trade right. of the day. It's the right. trade that mutual fund, uh, hedge fund portfolios are marked to, that everyone's retirement accounts are marked to, derivatives transactions are marked to, and they don't want to see it fractured uh, amongst Wall Street firms. Thank Understood. you. Understood. Thank you so much. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Uh, with that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Poliquin, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I would like to yield 20 seconds to my associate, French Hill, from Arkansas. It's summer, and uh, everybody here, it's a good crowd, Bruce. Everybody wants to go to Maine. We have Maine <laughs> travel brochures here, uh, the small blueberries, the lobsters. This will just save time because this will let Bruce have more time to ask his questions. I yield back. <laughs> Thank you. I reclaim my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. I, I'm a huge advocate for the state of Maine. I know all of you folks here who have not booked your Maine vacation remind you that there still is time. We do not use air conditioning in the state of Maine. We don't need it. Uh, and we do the have chair's plenty tempted to dock you 30 seconds for the <laughs> advertisement, but... Uh, prefer that you, uh, uh, you add that 30 seconds back on, Mr. Chairman, but if you don't, I'll understand. Thank you very much. I appreciate all you folks being here today. Uh, I represent uh, rural Maine, uh, not, the, uh, not the urban areas uh, that we have. Uh, we're very proud of our hardworking families, and we have thousands and thousands of small uh, businesses in the state of Maine and folks that are trying to save for their retirement and also for the college, uh, their kids' college education. Now, there's roughly $24 trillion in our economy uh, here in the states uh, of uh, retirement savings. And a lot of you folks here are responsible or in part play in that space. Mr. Lyons, one of the concerns I have uh, for those uh, folks that, that, that work in this space that help our families in Maine and throughout the country save their retirement is to make sure that when a trade is executed on behalf of your clients through some of these other folks in the space that, are, that, that the retail investor gets the best price at the lowest cost such that their rate of return will be the greatest such that they have the biggest nest egg humanly possible so they can enjoy their golden years. Now, could you do me a favor, sir? Could you walk us through a, a, a large institutional trade that would be conducted on behalf of one of your funds uh, and what does that look like? And maybe point out some of the problems, if there are any, that you run into uh, in that process. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Congressman Peliquin. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Capital Group represents, has as part of their investors, over 30,000 individuals from your district representing over $1.5 billion in assets. So it thank is you. pertinent to you. Thank you. Um, we, you know, for us to navigate, for us, we're a large active manager, we do fundamental analysis, our order sizers, quite large relative to the available market share, for instance, in the U.S., our average order is about 65 to 75 percent of the average daily volume. And so for us to be able to maximize the returns that our investors receive from that decision to invest in that um, position, we need to implement that in a way that minimizes inform information leakage, certainly, because as word gets out that a large institution is uh, investing in the marketplace, um, you know, the price starts to move. Mm -hmm. People start to free ride against that information. And so it's our concern to make sure that that information leakage is minimized. As a result, sir, might you break apart a large institutional order into smaller pieces and, and uh, execute the trade that way? And how could that help your clients? Yeah, we do. I mean, we look, we're, the basic strategy we take depends on the investment thesis, certainly. But in general, to minimize market impact, we will look to passively interact with the marketplace so that we can effectively avail ourselves to the liquidity that's available at that time. In the, same, in the same period, we look for large block liquidities to other large participants in the market that we can negotiate a large block on behalf, because that's typically the best is outcome it, for us. Is this, it, sir, please. Yes, but, but splitting the market, splitting the, the order into doling it out into the marketplace, we use advanced technologies to do that. We're connected to multiple liquidity pools, and we use that technology in the expertise of our traders to be able to do that effectively. Is, is this challenge that you have to make sure you get best price at the lowest cost a function of your size, or is there anything that you would recommend to this panel, to Congress, to the SEC, that would be an adjustment to the equity market structure that would help facilitate that such that our folks in Maine uh, receive the benefit of, 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 of the best performance they can yeah, for their thank retirement. thank you. I, I specifically think that um, looking at 
reducing conflicts of interest, um, specifically around the maker-taker pricing scheme. Give us an example of that. So, um, for instance, we're talking about, you know, why people interact with different markets and why then maybe the exchanges have uh, inferior execution. As broker-dealers implement investment decisions that I, that I may have, mm -hmm. um, part of what they try to do is, is um, control the economics around it, control their cost of executing that on my behalf. That maximizes their profit. In doing so, they try to utilize um, non-exchanges, non-displayed liquidity to sort of minimize those costs associated with the exchange. This really effectively diminishes the amount of order that interact in a lit market and really can have a, a detrimental impact on the price formation mechanism. So really, we look to see if there's ways to increase order flow into the lit market so that we can have robust um, price discovery mechanisms. And I think that that's, that's sort of the focus and it was really what we think can happen with all the suggestions we've made over the written testimony and oral testimony. Thank you very much, sir. I yield back my time. Congressman, can I get one of those brochures? We're planning a vacation. Yep. Uh, the chair will remind you of the Pure Michigan campaign is in full <laughs> swing as well, so. Go Cardinals. Uh, uh, anybody else care to risk being gaveled down? Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, with that, uh, the chair would like to recognize Mr. Budd from North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the risk of the gavel, the mountains of North Carolina are great this time of year. So, uh, Mr. Lyons, uh, so it's a general theme. Uh, we talk about most, most of the testimony that the markets of the United States that were very efficient, well capitalized, and, and high functioning compared to any in the world. But uh, if we talk about uh, the results, but you know, the results being lit transparency, liquidity, trust, confidence, efficiency, and fairness are just some of the things that I've heard mentioned. But what are some of the features that have led to that that make us unique versus other international equity markets? Um, and how do we ensure that we preserve those as we look at these equity markets and as we move forward? How do we make sure that we preserve those things that have led us to that, uh, that position? Well, it's a big, it's a big question, sure. and probably one that I'm not, uh, you know, adequately uh, prepared to to know all the answers. That's for sure. But I do think that any ways that we can impede frictions in the marketplace to allow natural buyers and sellers to interact with each other, to to try to limit the amount of intermediation, be unnecessary intermediation that exists in the marketplace, I think will benefit our markets. I think it'll lead to more trust. I think it'll uh, allow investors to take advantage of the investment managers that they entrust their savings to. So I really think that um, you know, focusing on the issues that we've talked about w will lead to that. Uh, and, and I would just say as an aside, and, and speaking about sort of the, the one-size-fits-all that, that Joe talked about, certainly there is a need for market makers to be in the market providing liquidity. And, and the maker-taker pricing scheme probably helps that, but really make, market makers should survive on the spread. And so if there are inefficiencies in the market between a small cap stock or a large cap stock, that should be embedded in the spread that market makers are willing to participate in. And I think that that would be more beneficial than having to entice them to be there to create artificial spreads. Mr. Brown, did you care to weigh in on that? Microphone. You know, around the globe, one of the things that I've mentioned is that the United States has the highest percentage of retail investors in the world, you know, and to me, that is, is a critical element, that we, having people trust our markets so that they can, as, as the other coaches mentioned, that, you know, this is their retirement savings. And so, you know, trading is not a game, you know, it's really, it's a tool for people to save their money, save up for retirement or save up for a house, whatever it is. So I think we have to remain focused that as in individual investors seek higher returns, you know, in, a, in particular in this low volatility environment, you know, there are risks that they may want to take, you know, as a firm like ours, we want to be able to work with our clients, offer them information so they can make better judgments about what it is they ought to do with their money. And so I would not want us to take steps that would, that would you know, disincent uh, individual investors from being in our marketplace. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein, uh, again, thank you for coming, each of you. Um, 
But you mentioned earlier that you've been on the trading floor for a long time, 20 years ago, and I happened to see the modern version of it just last week, being on the floor and seeing your company at work. Um, but before, you know, we talk a lot about how this may have hurt the retail investor or even the institutional investor, some of this technology. Um, but what in the past were some practices that were going on um, that have stopped as a result of technology that have put us in a p better position today? Thank you, Congressman. Well, you know, just like it's so easy to shop online using technology and get around using, uh, you know, different uh, uh, apps on our phone that can quickly tell you, you know, wh what the traffic patterns are, uh, technology and computing power is just going to um, really increase efficiency and accuracy. So as on the floor of the exchange, as a market maker, we would have to using our eyes and you just assess what uh, best price was, looking at what's happening in the options market, for example, uh, or, or watching what was happening on the on the, uh, in the commodities pits on the floor. But now, because of computers, so much more information can be analyzed and what that means, and, and other firms can compete using that same information. And what that means is you got all these market makers competing with very sophisticated technology, and what happens is the investor's got a very tight spread and saves money every time they trade. Thank you. Uh, just in the remaining few seconds, do you see on the horizon any of you um, use blockchain technology as a disruptive force in, in equity trading? I don't know if that's even on, on your radar uh, in the future for settlements. Not this time. All right, thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, with that, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. MacArthur, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's an interesting time, I think, to revisit Reg NMS and see how it has functioned over the last decade and where we might need to make changes. When I think about how that came about, and I think about the, the regulatory regime in the 70s that sort of gave rise to all of this national market system, it seems to me there's a couple of areas that were intended to, and they still are intended to, uh, to define the market. Efficiency, fairness, availability of in information, access for people, however they want to uh, access the market, uh, optimal execution. I want to focus on the fairness issue for a moment. And Mr. Brown, both you and Mr. Lyons have touched on this a little bit. How uh, different market participants interact with one, one another and whether things have become unbalanced. And I could take this in a number of different directions. Uh, you know, the make-or-taker uh, fee system has come up a few times. It reminds me of, uh, I came up in the insurance industry and we had issues back in the 90s where brokers were driving business in ways that seemed to have more to do with their own profitability than their clients' needs. It creates a lot of uh, unsettledness among participants, and I think that may happen in this area as well. But my question is back to the SROs. And Mr. Brown, I'll start with you. You specifically mentioned earlier that you're concerned that there are conflicts of interest, and that as the SROs have become for-profit enterprises and have expanded their business, done all the things that they should do as for-profit businesses, they're now in competition with other market participants. And that conflict has remained unchecked thus far. So I'd like you to unpack that a little bit. Uh, what are some of the areas of conflict? What should happen? to alleviate that, who should act here? Should it be Congress? Should it be the market, you know, the whole industry? How do we fix uh, some of these areas so there's not this uh, doubt in the marketplace about why companies do what they do? You're absolutely right, sir, that, uh, that exchanges as for-profit corporations have a duty to make money for their shareholders. That's their fiduciary duty, and they, sh and they need to do that. But, they operate under this mantle of self-regulatory operation or self-regulatory organization. And that is a, a, a government-granted um, status that says they have the right to regulate their participants, the people who use their system. And yet, when they compete with those members for routing of orders or other things, they then uh, are both regulator and competitor, and that 
is a conflict that very difficult to, to mitigate. So who should fix that? Well, um, I think Congress. I would urge Congress to, to look into this issue and to say, is it, is it still a part of our national market system, a fundamental ingredient that we have self-regulatory organizations that are actual businesses? We have a self-regulator, FINRA. FINRA is a true regulator. They could absorb the regulatory function and Congress could, could delegate to them to absorb the regulatory function while exchanges, and turn exchanges free from being SROs. They could be, yeah, and to be commercial enterprises as they are. Do any of the others of you see value in the exchanges being SROs? And not as has been proposed using someone else like FENRA to do that? Congressman, if I may, I, I think exchanges enjoy a, a number of uh, benefits from being an SRO, one of them being immunity as well. They do have some sort of immunity when it comes to regulatory issues if there's a trade error or, you know, as is in the Facebook case, the Facebook IPO that was a problem. And that's a, that's a nice benefit to have, yet they still are in the for-profit business. So I, I think to square those two up is a bit of a challenge, and maybe that does need to be separated there. I would only add that there certainly is an important function that SROs perform and exchanges perform in terms of monitoring and surveilling what's going on in the market to detect manipulative or, or bad practices. So I, I think they serve a role working in that capacity. Um, to answer your question about what should be done, I really think the SEC needs to s take a leading role in this and advocate for additional participants, non-SROs, to be part of the NMS governance package. I'm sorry, my time is up. Perhaps you could respond uh, in writing afterwards if you would, or somebody else may have the same question. I will leave you with this. Uh, New Jersey and you, perfect together. <laughs> and a lot closer than Maine. Thank you. Definitely gaveling this closed now. Okay. Uh, well, we, uh, we are going to be moving into our next panel here shortly. I'm going to be recessing for two minutes. Um, and I mean two minutes, uh, but I do want to thank our distinguished panel uh, for your time and your effort being here today. Uh, it is deeply appreciated. I know that these conversations will continue. Uh, and uh, again, I just want to say thank you for your uh, expertise and your insight. So uh, with that, uh, the committee is uh, recessed for two minutes.
The uh, committee will reconvene, and um, I would like to say thank you to our second panel uh, for your patience of uh, being here, and uh, but we also think that might have been valuable to have heard from some of the participants. I think that was uh, a goal and objective of mine. Uh, was to, uh, to get some of those views out of uh, folks who had been using the system and using the markets and are engaged in that on a daily basis. And, and uh, we now have uh, the privilege of hearing directly from uh, those of you representing uh, the markets. And real quickly, again, uh, we will uh, run over our panel. Uh, second panel here is uh, Tom Farley, president of New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Brad Katsuyama, CEO of Investors Exchange, IEX. Uh, Chris Concannon, who is the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Chicago Board of Options and Exchange. Uh, John Comerford, Head of Global Trading Research at uh, Instanet. And Tom Whitman, Executive Vice President and Global uh, Head of Equities for NASDAQ. And I uh, really appreciate uh, each of you being here today. And uh, I think we're going to dispense with the opening statements uh, from, uh, from us on this panel and uh, move right into the opening statements from all of you. So with that, Mr. Farley, you are recognized for five minutes. And if you'd please turn your mic on, the red, the red button right at the front. There we go. Thank you so much, Thank Chairman you. Huizenga, Ranking Member Maloney, all the members of the subcommittee. As the Chairman said, I'm, I'm Tom. I'm the President of New York Stock Exchange. I've submitted written testimony, so I wasn't going to just read verbatim the testimony, and rather I was going to provide a few thoughts on the history of, of, of markets and how it relates to uh, the subject matter today. That, that would be fine, and I should remind the panel that uh, each of you have put in a written uh, testimony, which will be submitted for the record. So uh, with that. We celebrated a big birthday last month, the 225th birthday of the New York Stock Exchange. And if you, you go back to the origin, the stock exchange was founded right at the corner of Wall Street and Broad Street in New York. And that was actually also where the country was, was born, essentially. George Washington was sworn in there. The first Congress of the United States was right at Wall and Broad. The Bill of Rights was ratified, so on and so forth. And in those days, uh, entrepreneurs, Alexander Hamilton was one of the first, actually. He founded Bank of New York. They would show up in the corner, and they'd pitch their ideas. And there were prospective investors there. And the prospective investors would hear, is this a good idea, is this not a good idea? And they would allocate capital judiciously. In order to entice that capital allocation, they started trading the securities day after day because the investors wanted to know, if I give you money, Alexander, and I change my mind in the future, how do I know I can get it back? So the act of raising that capital is really the primary function of an exchange, and that everyday trading is the secondary function of an exchange. That's what we think of as, as a stock market. And if you fast forward, 225 years, that's exactly what we do today. Our mission has not changed, it has not wavered. We help great men and women raise capital to go turn their dreams into reality and go make life better for Americans and global citizens. And as a necessary byproduct of that, we also operate very efficient secondary markets for trading of those securities. And, and that's kind of how it works. And even in those earliest days, Traders would show up at the corner of Wall and Broad and they would say publicly, this is where I'm willing to buy this particular stock, this is where I'm willing to sell this particular stock, and that was displayed liquidity, and that was the lifeblood of this secondary market. And again, nothing has changed. The New York Stock Exchange, just by way of background, has flourished during that time. I can say with all due humility, because I had nothing to do with the first two centuries, as you might imagine. But we're the uh, uh, largest exchange in the world, 40 trillion of market, uh, pardon me, 30 trillion of market cap, around about 40% of all market cap in the world is listed with us. And so I come into this meeting with very much a bias and perspective of the listed companies. And from the listed companies perspective, something's wrong. If you look, the number of companies is down by almost half over the last 20 years. IPOs have declined dramatically. The 10 year period starting in 1991, the lowest number of IPOs in a given year in the US was 350. In the current 10-year period that we're in, the highest number of IPOs is 290. So you're seeing fewer and fewer companies go public, which is not a good thing for society. That's fewer investment choices, fewer companies that the retail public can take advantage of value creation. And so the question is, why? Well, the market's actually working pretty well for big companies, because the aggregate market cap is growing. 
So the number of companies is shrinking, but aggregate market cap is growing, which means the average company is much bigger. The Bank of America is the JP Morgans in, in your district, Congresswoman Maloney. They can afford to deal with the challenges of being public, but the small to mid-sized businesses can't. They're swamped. The pendulum has swung too far. In fact, the pendulum is kind of beating them about the head. They're having to deal with the litigation environment in this country. They're having to deal with regulatory creep, and I think the ever-expanding scope of Sarbanes-Oxley is a good example of that. They're having to deal with new regulations that have come about largely from Dodd-Frank that reflect a social agenda untethered from whether the disclosures required are actually material to investors. I mean, this is a very difficult environment. One thing that really drives, drives our listed companies a little bit bonkers is dealing with these proxy advisory firms, which are so powerful and opaque uh, and, and, and have a lot of kind of importance but not, but not accountability. And so we think we, we need to focus first on that primary part of the market. I know today's mostly about the secondary function, trading of securities, but I, I felt like I, I had to make that important point because that, uh, that's driving so much of what, what concerns us in the, in the stock markets today. Just briefly on the secondary point, on the secondary market, in other words, in the stock market, we'll talk a lot about it. I look forward to the Q&A. I will come at it from a perspective, again, of the listed company. They look at the markets and they say, wow, this has gotten very fragmented. For the small and mid-sized companies, our spreads have widened. For the big companies, again, it's working, it's working well. But small to mid-sized companies, there's a real problem. And the listed companies are asking us, and in turn, I'm asking you and, 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 and our regulators, focus on simplicity, focus on transparency. That's what the listed companies are looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Katsuyama, five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Huizinga, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to offer this testimony. I appreciate your willingness to provide a forum to consider ways to strengthen the U.S. equity markets. Um, my name is Brad Katsuyama. I'm the co-founder and CEO of IEX Group. We're the newest national stock exchange. And as an exchange, we continue to innovate and prioritize the interests of investors. And pending regulatory approval from the SEC, we will compete for corporate listings later this year. U.S. equity markets are a critical national asset. Capital formation is key to economic growth. And today we must ask, do the markets serve the interests of investors, companies, and capital formation, or do they serve themselves? All market structure changes should be evaluated through this lens. And if the equity markets are not evolving in a way that best serves these constituents, action should be taken. When we say the word investor, many people instinctively think of mom and pop with a retail brokerage. However, mutual funds, pension funds, and institutions manage 63% of U.S. equity holdings, which reflects the savings and retirements of everyday Americans. This distinction is important because today's market has been optimized for trading in small size with little consideration for the needs of large institutional investors. Many of the public, com many of the public companies we have met with over the past couple of years are frustrated with the opacity and complexity of the current markets as they realize the exchanges they rely on for market support have significant conflicts of interest and their confidence and trust in the market is undermined. Technology drove the majority of improvements in the equity markets over the past two decades. Um, efficiencies such as increased automation, lower costs, and faster speed. But if you consider the advances in technology brought to the public in other industries, in the equity markets, exchanges, and certain traders have largely hoarded these technology benefits at the expense of investors. The proper role of an exchange is to act as a neutral referee, providing the most accurate price to both sides of the trade. And unfortunately, exchanges fail in this role by selling a faster view of market data to high-speed traders than the exchange itself relies on to price trades on its own market. And in, in essence, they have sold high-speed firms the ability to trade while the referee looks the other way. A critical turning point for U.S. equity markets occurred when the national stock exchanges made the conscious decision to sell high-speed data and technology instead of allowing third-party vendors to compete at selling these products in the open market. This decision by exchanges conflict with their role as self-regulatory organizations responsible for maintaining fair and orderly markets. Exchanges purposely selling multiple versions of the same stock market based on tiers of access, data, and technology benefit only the fastest high-speed traders at the expense of all others, which is anything but fair or orderly. Exchanges deciding, to, uh, exchanges deciding to sell data and technology also enabled monopoly power. Clearly, there is no substitute for New York Stock Exchange market data being sold by NYSE inside of the NYSE data center. No other entity can provide this level of access, and all of the, it, and all of the major exchanges abuse this monopoly. A broker recently cited their NYSE market data costs to receive market data increased by 700% since 2008. 
a shocking figure when you consider rapidly declining technology costs in other industries. IEX can say from our own experience that what exchanges charge for data and access bears no rational relationship to what it costs to produce it. The greatest irony is that investors and brokers create market data when they send orders and trade. The exchange just aggregates this information and sells it back to the industry. So exchanges just effectively deliver the news. They don't make the news, they don't write the stories, but the governance committee who oversees market data is operated by the exchanges with no broker or investor representation, and this should change. Finally, the most harmful but easily addressed conflict is the, is the practice of exchanges paying $2.5 billion a year in rebates to brokers to send them orders. Exchanges reap profits by selling those orders back to the industry in the form of market data, and this practice also creates a conflict of interest as brokers keep the vast majority of rebates that exchanges pay them, even when routing client orders. In fact, two former SEC chief economists stated that, in quotes, in other contexts, these payments will be recognized as illegal kickbacks. Publicly available data shows that exchanges who pay the highest rebates per share for providing liquidity provide, on average, worse execution quality. But despite these downsides, the large rebate exchanges have the largest market share and the longest lines to trade, which is alarming. Would a reasonable person ever wait on the longest line for a worse outcome? The answer is no, but in the equity markets, that's happening millions of times a day, every day, as brokers are paid to get in the longest line despite what is in the best interest of their clients. We face a unique bipartisan opportunity to deregulate the stock market for the benefit of investors and companies. Many of the complex regulations in place today were originally designed to protect investors, but over time they resemble band-aid solutions to manage a market plagued by conflicts of interest. Parts of Reg NMS could be relaxed or removed if rebates were eliminated. Brokers would be free to focus on providing clients with the best execution quality. Exchanges would compete without the conflict of paying $2.5 billion per year in rebates, and as a result, market data, technology costs would, de would decrease to competitive levels, delivering value back to brokers, traders, and investors without the need for further government price controls. All of this is possible by eliminating rebates and, align and aligning the interests of exchanges, brokers, investors, and companies. We have the largest, most important stock market in the world, a pillar of American capitalism, but nothing about a healthy market and competitive market should require artificial incentives for people to trade. I look forward to the opportunity to discussing this further. Yeah, this time Thanks. has expired. Uh, with that, Mr. Concanon, you have five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm Chris Concanon, President and Chief Operating Officer of the CBOE Holdings. I would like to thank the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. I also commend the subcommittee for its ongoing review of complex critical issues that exist within the U.S. equity markets, including issues like reg regulation and MS. CBOE is one of the world's largest exchange holding companies. We offer the industry's widest array of products, including options, futures, equities, ETFs, FX, and proprietary index products, such as S&P 500 options, and futures and options on the CBOE Volatility Index, or VIX. In 1975, Congress amended the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 to facilitate the establishment of a national market system to link together the multiple exchanges. Congress intended for the Securities and Exchange Commission to, uh, to take advantage of the opportunities created by advancements in technology to preserve and strengthen the securities markets. In response the, to this congressional mandate, the SEC has adopted various rules since 1975 to further the objectives of the national market system, including Regulation NMS in 2005. The implementation of Regulation NMS has contributed positive results to our markets, market quality, and reliability continue to improve, and retail customers now have low-cost, immediate access to our markets with exceptional execution quality. However, regulation NMS has also contributed to some unintended consequences throughout the marketplace. While order protection is beneficial to displayed limit orders, the existence of order protection provides new or relatively small exchanges with a commercial advantage despite not having to dis demonstrate their value to the marketplace. Any competitive benefit that may result from an additional exchange can be offset by the increased costs and complexity relating to the required connectivity to an additional market. The U.S. equity market currently supports 12 equity exchanges and over 40 SEC registered dark pools. I assure you that was not what Congress anticipated in 1975. Now, complexity and fragmentation is not itself a problem. 
Our market quality for retail orders clearly reflects that we have professionally solved for these two challenges. However, certain orders and certain market participants experience serious challenges as a result of this fragmentation and complexity. The handling of large orders for institutional customers has clearly suffered over the last 10 years. While spreads have narrowed, there is less displayed liquidity to satisfy large orders. The current market experiences uh, a greater market impact as these large orders enter the market. And as a result, those large orders take longer to get executed and may experience reduced execution quality. This large order, size, large order size problem affects our nation's largest asset managers, including pension funds and mutual funds. These challenges that, uh, these challenges that large orders experience are not in every symbol across the U.S. equity market. Those challenges are typically not experienced in more liquid stocks, which include large cap names and ETFs. In this regard, I believe Reagan MS was critically flawed in its one-size-fits-all approach to, the, to our markets. Under regulation NMS, all stocks are treated similarly regardless of market cap liquidity or public float. Our, our current market rules do not care if a stock trades once a month or one million times per day. Our market rules do not care if a company is valued at 800 billion or 25 million. This is not an ideal design for the largest, most diverse equity market on the planet. Given these flaws and the challenges that RegnMS has created in our equity market, I encourage the subcommittee and the SEC to undertake a comprehensive review of regulation NMS to address some of these unintended consequences given the significant changes to our marketplace since its implement implementation in 2007. Um, as part of a comprehensive review of regu regulation NMS, we urge the subcommittee and the SEC to consider the appropriateness of the one-size-fits-all approach of the regulation. We also believe that other aspects of, of regulation M NMS warrant reconsideration. We believe the outdated access fee cap and the prohibition on locked and crossed markets are both worth revisiting. We also suggest consideration of a market structure that would only protect quoted quotes displayed by exchanges that meet a minimum market share threshold, which is an approach used in the Canadian markets. I also recommend the subcommittee urge the Commission to study the recent phenomenon of what I call ultra high price stocks and their impact on investors and market structure. Currently over 13% of the overall market capitalization of the U.S. equity market is comprised of securities that trade above $200, including well-known names like Amazon and Alphabet, uh, each currently trading over $1,000 per share. While our current equity market structure has its flaws, I believe the U.S. equity market continues to be the most efficient and liquid markets in the world. I encourage any proposed reforms to carefully consider the impact of all market participants and the potential unintended consequences of the market. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. With that, Mr. Comerford, you have five minutes. Uh, Chairman Hazinga, Ranking Member Maloney, members of the subcommittee. Incinet appreciates the invitation to participate in this important hearing. We believe that Incinet, an agency broker founded in 1969, can bring a unique perspective to this process. For nearly 50 years, Incinet has provided institutional investors with electronic agency trading services and technologies. Services including the first electronic trading platform, the first U.S. crossing network in 1986, and some of the market's earliest examples of direct market access, smart order routing, and algorithmic trading strategies. Incinet has also been a leader in offering robust transparency to its clients with some of the first transactions cost reporting and analysis tools in the industry. At its core, Incinet has been guided for nearly half a century by one primary goal, providing best execution to its customers. Looking back at 10 years of regulation and NMS, I believe we can definitely say that it has been successful in its goals of enhancing the efficiency of the market and supporting fair and vigorous competition. However, in order to retain our market's competitive advantage, we need to review whether our regulations, one, continue to provide a level playing field for vigorous competition, enhance confidence both for retail and institutional customers, and continue to support innovation. As others on this panel will likely cover the regulatory path to NMS and share their insights into rules 605, 606, 610, and 611, I thought that I'd discuss a less obvious but no less critical component of regulation NMS, namely Rule 612, the subpenny rule. A little bit of history. 
Uh, the tick size on the primary U.S. exchanges began its decline in 1997, dropping from the longstanding one-eighth of a dollar, that's 12 and a half cents, to teenies or one-sixteenth of a dollar. This change was driven in many ways by competition from the ECNs at the time. In 2001, U.S. equity markets fully decimalized. It is worthy to note that it was decimalization more than regulation NMS that drove average spreads down towards the levels that we currently experience. Rule 612 set the floor on this tick size compression, setting the minimum pricing increment of quotes and orders to one penny for all stocks trading over a dollar. At the time, a penny seemed reasonable. However, we now know that tick sizes can be both too large and too small. We better understand that our one size fits all tick size can contribute to some of the unnecessarily complex and disorderly trading that we've been discussing on these panels. Markets are more efficient and orderly when costs and incentives are balanced for disparate market participants. As Mr. Lyon said in the previous panel, the tick size or spread is the primary incentive for liquidity providers to dis display li liquidity. And it is also the primary cost liquidity takers pay for immediacy of execution. For lower priced and higher volume names, a penny tick size can be too large. And when tick sizes are too large, competition at the NBBO becomes extremely fierce and volume is pushed towards dark pools and towards inverted exchanges. In general, the market gets extremely complex and there's a premium placed on speed and the use of advanced order types. On the other hand, for higher price and lower liquidity stocks, even some of the stocks that Mr. Concannon discussed just now, large stocks, small percentage tick sizes, think a penny and $1,000 is very little, reduce the incentive to post lit liquidity. Spreads increase and liquidity becomes hidden and more disorderly. Rule 612 was designed specifically to combat this activity, specifically, and I quote, to promote greater price transparency and consistency as well as to protect displayed limit orders and address the practice of stepping ahead of displayed limit orders by trivial amounts. In conclusion, I would like to note that while I focus on one specific rule in Reg NMS, market structure issues are complex and interrelated. The tick size and the access fee in particular are completely related. Therefore, any material changes to market structure inputs are best considered holistically and comprehensively rather than independently. We had incident. Thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts and opinions. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mr. Whitman, you are recognized for five minutes. With time to spare. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hazinga and Ranking Member Maloney for the opportunity to testify today. I applaud your hard work to help bolster our public markets. Let me begin with a few observations about the U.S. marketplace. Our markets are the strongest and fairest capital markets around the globe. They are the envy of the world. U.S. equities are unmatched in liquidity, depth, and transparency. Only data-driven analysis should underpin potential changes. Reagan MS is not perfect, but it has achieved its intended target of enhanced competition among exchanges, improved resiliency, and lowered the overall cost of trading. Self-regulation remains critical to investors and the U.S. equities market. Investors must have confidence that the markets are fair and well-regulated. Without SROs, the SEC would face serious challenges to protect investors and ensure a fair and transparent market that is available to all. Without SROs, the SEC would have to grow significantly. The SEC's Equity Market Structure Advisory Committee membership lacks key viewpoints in its recommendations do not address broader and deeper issues, such as the lack of capital formation. Capital formation is a central issue facing the markets today. The focus of all market structure discussions should be how do we improve the liquidity and trading experience for small public companies. The trading environment fails to take into account the size and the needs of smaller public companies. Market structure has real and at times unattended impact. The smallest companies have <clears throat> had their trading sp uh, spread across 50 venues. The fragmentation, I believe, hurts the trading in those securities. Market structure is evolving to better serve investors without regulatory or legislative action. For example, the last time NASDAQ testified before this sub subcommittee, the speed and resilience of market data was discussed often and was against in the, in the panel before us. Since then, NASDAQ has enhanced the securities, NASDAQ Securities Information Process, or the SIP, with state-of-the-art technology that's simultaneously strengthened resiliency and reduced processing time by over 90 percent, a technological advancement that NASDAQ is especially proud of to deliver to the markets. The duty to provide fair and equal access should be harmonized across all platforms to protect investors from unfair discrimination, avoid two-tiered markets, and unify a liquidity that is fragmented over 50 execution venues. 
Regulators must consider the structural advantages of off-exchange trading when considering new layers of regulation that could push additional trading off-exchange. NASDAQ's perspective on market structure is unique. We operate closer to the intersection of capital formation and market structure than many market participants. Our revitalized recommendations center on many items this committee has already considered as part of the Financial Choice Act. You can find this in the, uh, the full testimony that we presented uh, in written format. The key regulations that form the foundation of today's markets, including Reg NMS and Reg ATS, were developed and implemented more than a decade ago. Today's liquidity dilemma stems from long-term trends towards fragmentation. Where liquidity is spread across too many trading venues, nearly half of the U.S. publicly traded companies, small and medium growth, trade more than 50 percent of their volume off U.S. exchanges. This hurts price formation. NASDAQ believes permitting issuers to choose to trade in an environment that concentrates liquidity for small and medium growth companies into a single exchange will allow investors to better source liquidity. The introduction of unlisted trading privileges gave rise to fragmentation combined with a proliferation of ATSs. When it comes to UTP, the law of diminishing marginal returns applies, and we have far exceeded the point of which the benefit outweighs the cost. Every company listed in the U.S. markets trades with the same standard tick sizes, but advancements in technology make this unnecessary. And as experience and research demonstrates that one size fit, fits all for tick sizes is not appropriate, particularly in small and medium growth companies. NASDAQ believes that these companies should have the ability to trade on subpenny, penny, nickel, or even dime increments. Both NASDAQ and the NICE petitioned the SEC for this reform many years ago with nothing to show. Implement, we believe that implementation of an intelligent rebate fee structure that promotes liquidity and avoids market distortions. NASDAQ relies on liquidity rebates to motivate market makers to enter aggressive quotations in which return ensures that price discovery is accurate and reliable. This is critically important for illiquid securities. NASDAQ believes that the study, that a study for rebate levels must be well designed to help develop an intelligent fee rebate regime. We firmly believe that a blunt access fee pilot does not consider the impact of liquidity and could harm smaller company stocks. Establish regulatory harmony to protect more. Investors, investor orders should be equally protected whenever, wherever executed. The Commission must explain why the 60 percent of orders that are executed on exchange merit higher level of protection than the 40 percent of orders executed off exchange. In times of stress or crisis, the Commission naturally turns exchanges to add safety nets like Reg SCI, Reg Show, Limit Up, Limit Down was the burden of, for exchanges to solve. One size does not fit all. Well-functioning markets require a mix of market participants, issuers, and investors. A system must accommodate passive investing, high-frequency trading, and business models in between. And perhaps most importantly, the markets must work efficiently for all issuers, from $50 million in notional value to $750 billion. I look forward to the uh, questions that this committee has for me. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony, and uh, we are going to try to move fast before we, uh, we have votes somewhere. I have not seen a real recent, but the last I had seen somewhere between 115 and 130. Um, and uh, I would like to, uh, to start, uh, I think, primarily with Mr. Uh, Farley, Mr. Whitman, uh, you and, and Mr. Kincan and, and all of you have heard me ask Mr. Lyons and Mr. Brown from the previous uh, panel about allowing broker-dealers and asset managers to have direct voting representation on NMS plan operating uh, committees. Um, I understand uh, both uh, NASDAQ and NICE are opposed to that. Uh, Mr. Concanon um, uh, at uh, CBO, uh, your exchange has not opposed necessarily giving uh, broker-dealers, I believe Mr. Katsuyama as well, but view a bit of a different, uh, uh, different animal uh, at IEX. Um, so I want to know if, if you would please address that, and then also I want to give you a little time. Would you also like to address some of the points uh, that uh, were raised in the first panel uh, with regard to, uh, to SIP versus market data and, and any of those other issues? So, Mr. Whitman, why don't we uh, start with you? Okay. I was actually, uh, when you look at, you know, the governance structure there, uh, there are advisors from broker-dealers that sit on that committee and have uh, a, a voice in the conversation that takes place. Uh, it's correct they don't have a voting right, but there is more transparency on those committees as they're structured today. Uh, they, as we looked at the the, the SIP replatform that NASDAQ did, uh, it has reduced latency extensively, or and uh, we did a replatform of that of that uh, SIP. So we think they have adequate 
visibility and transparency into what takes place at those uh, meetings right now. Mr. Cannon? Uh, in the, in the past, uh, before, before I actually go, sure. Mr. Whitman, is there anything else that you wanted to address from that first panel that you wanted to touch on? No, that's it. Okay. All right, Mr. Cannon. Uh, I agree with Tom that the, um, the, the plan, the SIP plan and the governance uh, has improved uh, fairly dramatically over the last couple of years uh, with respect to transparency and uh, the advisory level participation. Uh, in the past, we had been supported of, of, of uh, introducing both buy, buy side and sell side participants uh, into the full committee of, of the SRO plan. Um, we, we're willing to consider that kind of participation. I, I do think the SIP serves a valuable need for our markets. Um, and, and in fact, clients do see the SIP when they're going to execute a, a quote. Uh, if you look at um, some of the, the comments, I'll address some of the comments from the prior panel with regard to market data. There is heated competition in market data around proprietary market data. We compete with both the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ uh, for our proprietary market data, and we've seen adjustments in price uh, for the benefit of the end user as a result of that competition. So I assure you uh, there is thriving competition in the world of pr pr proprietary market data. I do think, uh, and I agree uh, with the prior panelists, that there's probably more room for adjustment around the plan and the SIP plan itself. Mr. Farley? Yeah, we're, we're very strong proponents for more uh, inclusion in policymaking around the plans. Uh, in fact, uh, the New York Stock Exchange has really been pushing to strengthen the advisory committees that, that we have that have broad rep representation uh, from throughout the industry. But the one other point I wanted to make about the plans that I, I think is important is, um, and the SEC can make rules, or the SEC can delegate to the NMS group that they go away and they make rules. And over the recent past, the SEC has been using that second approach far more often. And that engenders a good deal of ill will. Quite frankly, the exchanges are perceived to then be in charge of policymaking. In reality, what goes on is the SEC is directing uh, that policymaking. And so- So uh, you, you don't think that's been a positive? Right, I do not think it's been a positive. I think when the, when the SEC goes through and does the work and goes through the appropriate legwork, the appropriate appropriations process, the appropriate cost benefit analysis, public comment, uh, you, get up, you get a better rule that has more buy-in from the industry than if you go through this NMS rulemaking. So why has the SEC done that? I, ha you'd have to ask the SEC. I don't want to speak on their Chris? behalf. Uh, in all honesty, it's quicker. Um, it's a process that allows the exchanges to take on the burden of writing the rules, uh, presenting them the, to the SEC for their approval. This did work in response to the flash crash uh, with, the, with the exchanges getting together quickly and writing rules around limit up, limit down protections. So there's times when it works and when it's appropriate, but there's been a, a heavy use of pushing the, the burden of rule writing to the exchanges and the plans themselves. And do you agree that that has damaged those relationships? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the tick pilot's a perfect example of where we really didn't um, agree on all points of the tick pilot, but we were mandated to deliver a set of rules that left the industry quite frustrated. Okay. My, uh, my time has expired. I would love to have explored the IPO situation. I um, applaud uh, Chairman Clayton uh, expressing his concern as well, and I think that's something we're gonna need to address. Uh, so uh, with that, I recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all of the panelists, a truly outstanding panel. I, I particularly would like to uh, welcome uh, Thomas Farley and Thomas Whitman from the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, two extraordinary companies in the great city of New York, and really all of the panelists for being here. I, I, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Whitman and, and Farley, the, the SEC's uh, Equity Market Structure Advisory Committee has recommended that the SEC do a pilot program to test whether market quality improves with lower rebates. Uh, do you think they should go ahead with this uh, pilot program? And if so, who should design it, the SEC, or, or should they go with the Committee of Exchanges like they did with the tick size pilot program? I'll go ahead first, Tom. Huh? Okay. Uh, th thank you for the nice greeting, and thank you for your service on behalf thank of the you. people in New York. Um, 
great, great question. It goes back to my comments from just prior about NMS rulemaking and asking the exchanges to make it versus the exchanges going through the effort themselves. We feel strongly uh, that the SEC, if they so chose to, to, to engage in a rulemaking, should do so through the appropriate rulemaking process as opposed to delegating that to the exchanges. Okay. Secondarily, just with respect to this uh, uh, equity market structure advisory committee, uh, we're not on that, nor is Tom. They got the composition wrong. We've been told that privately and even to some extent publicly. Uh, it does not include our input. Therefore, it doesn't take into account the listed company view, which, quite frankly, I would argue is the single most important view there is. And so they didn't get it right with respect to this particular recommendation, and there's a lot of work to do. Thank you. I would say when you take a look at, at access fees, I think, we're look, I think they're looking at the, the wrong way. They're looking at the cap and access fee. And as an exchange that looks to list companies, we've got 3,300 companies that we list. Uh, we're focusing on the small and mid-sized companies. I think you need to take the conversation more towards the rebate. How do we liquefy the small and mid-sized companies? Uh, and it could take varying different levels of a rebate in order to, to bring those companies to the public markets. So uh, we're focused there on intelligent rebates, intelligent tick sizes, and not so much on the access fee cap. And I think it's more small and mid-sized companies that we're, that we're focused on here. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Katsuyama, you said in your testimony that the prices that exchanges charge for market data bears no relationship to the cost of producing that data. And, and what are the costs uh, for, for an exchange of producing market data? And secondly, how much lower would uh, market data fees be if exchanges only charge the cost of producing that data? So market data is produced in much the same way that, you know, a, a, a radio program would be broadcast, which means there's an upfront fixed investment in building an infrastructure, um, and then adding additional listeners to that market data comes with some incremental cost, but it's de minimis. It's plugging cables into a, um, into a switch. And so, you know, we experienced this firsthand when IEX, uh, you know, before we traded our first share, we were subscribing to market data. Um, you know, we were paying over a million dollars uh, for market data, but you don't just pay for the data itself, you pay in the method with which you receive the data. Um, you have to buy the cable, you have to rent the cable. Um, if you look at, you know, New York Stock Exchange for their most expensive, fastest cable, it's, it's almost half a million dollars a year to rent that cable, and the cable itself is $500 for a pair of them one time. Um, it gets pretty distortive. Now, you could say, well, we plug these cables into a switch, but even if you allocate cost per switch, you're probably talking about a couple thousand dollars, uh, $4,000 one time, which you're renting to me for almost half a million dollars a year. So um, I would say that it's, it's, it's distortive. It's probably 95% plus margin if we really got into the details, and, and we should look at those details um, because you know, when you're required to buy market data, um, it begs the question whether the prices for those data has any relationship with, with you know, what it costs to produce it. And the challenge becomes is, you know, as Chris said, we compete. You know, there is no competition for an exchange producing their own data sold with access they, they deliver in, in that data center. And I think that um, it's, it's not a competition. Okay. Uh, my, my time is almost over, so I would like to ask a unanimous consent to place in the record uh, um, statements and documents from Healthy Markets, uh, Transparency and Trust, and Modern IR, Market Structure. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. General Lady yields back. Uh, with that, the uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the panel. Uh, Mr. Whitman, if you would tell us about the current liquidity for the top 100 or so stocks listed on uh, NASDAQ. Some say the structure is broken. Is that visible in those stocks? And if not, where is it visible? I think the, uh, if you look at the liquidity profile in the, in the top 100 stocks, there is a tremendous amount of liquidity. I, I think that is charged a bit with, you know, in, in other committees or other uh, market structure advisory committee, if you take a look at some of the rebates for those very liquid securities, you probably don't need a 30 mil rebate in order to liquefy those securities. So, you know, we are looking at these small and mid-sized companies, getting these companies to go public and, and make sure that we've got a, a good reference price for those. And I think it's there where we, that, you know, that we struggle. Uh, 
two factors, rebates, tick sizes, um, and, and maybe a third one would be off exchange trading. The market makers that are in the public markets trying to fight to trade order flow don't see that order flow in public markets, but they see them in ATSs. So those three factors, I think, is what we need to work on to charge the mid and small size companies liquidity. Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, Let's just go another step. So if uh, I think you testified, or I read it in your testimony, that NASDAQ has supported the idea of intelligent tick sizes, and this is Mr. Whitman still. How would that compare to the tick pilot regime that's in place today? So I think, you know, what we've done is we've taken a one-size-fits-all market, and then we've carved out another piece and put it into three buckets. So it's maybe three sizes trying to fit everything. I think in, that tick, in the tick pilot, there are some, some, some good and some bad, and I think you need to take a look at the securities that are reacting better and worse and be more intelligent about the size of the tick. They may be tick constrained. And also with the same conversation, look at rebates because I think they're going to be tightly interwoven. Rebates for those securities and the size of the tick, whether it's pennies, nickels, dimes. There are securities that trade in, in a penny market that they could literally trade in a, probably a quarter of a penny market. So there's, it's, it's tick constrained. It could be even smaller. Mr. Concanon, you I think you also talked about tick sizes. Do you have any comment? Yeah, I, I would agree uh, wholeheartedly with Tom on, on that concept. Um, the, you know, the one-size-fits-all clearly doesn't work. Uh, with regard to the NASDAQ 100, um, they are performing exceptionally well. Uh, retail investors are experiencing phenomenal execution quality in those products, uh, and institutional investors are able to move large sizes of liquidity uh, through our market. So. I do think at the top end of our market, we have a robust and efficient market, and it's working. Uh, as you go down the tier of volume and liquidity, there's adjustments that we need to make. Uh, one, one adjustment is clearly the tick size. The tick, uh, the tick size pilot does attempt to um, uh, take a step in that direction. But it's only adjusting it in one direction. It's only adjusting in one direction, and it's, uh, it's, it's fairly simple in its approach because it is a pilot. Uh, so there's more that we can do to... Um, to really change how Reg and MS, which is a one-size-fits-all rule, uh, treats each stock individually based on its liquidity, based on its market cap. Mr. Comerford, uh, you uh, were talking a little bit about this tick size as well and how it impacts what you do. Uh, we talk about, or at least the last panel did, and I think to some extent this panel has, we talk about how the cost of trading has uh, gone down in the last uh, decade plus, uh, but what we're not talking about is where we've, uh, we, well, we are talking about it, but not directly. Uh, with the reduced tick, uh, uh, the decimal system, and the reduction in cost, what has this meant for the research and the analysis on different companies that is available to people out there? Uh, it, well, if I, if I could first talk a little bit about the tick sizes really quickly. The, my point um, that is that there are actually large cap names that, act, that have the wrong tick size. So Alphabet has the wrong tick size. That is not enough consideration for liquidity providers to provide depth of market. So I, th I think that we have to look not just, not just at the liquidity of the stock, but, but also at the price of the stock. And we can actually look across the Atlantic where with MIFID II, ESMA is making a change where they are changing and they're creating a tick size schedule. They already have tick size schedules based on price. They're creating tick size schedules based on price and liquidity. And because they're doing that, they're gonna set up markets that are more uniformly orderly in their trading, maybe not uniform in their tick size, but uniform in their trading. Thank you very much. I see my time's expired. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, uh, the chair recognized the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the, the panelists for, uh, for coming before the committee and helping us with their work. Mr. Katsuyama, uh, really appreciate the work you've done to democratize the markets. And uh, I, I have one question, though. It, it's, it's, a rather, it's, a, it's a curious sort of oddity. Uh, so you've adopted this speed bump, this, what is it, 350? How long, how long is the delay now? 350 millionths of a second. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Uh, and and I, I think that that has, 
well, let me ask you, do you think it's accomplished its, its goal? So I do think it accomplishes the goal we set out to, which, which ensures essentially a lot of people view the race as a race between participants in the market, a fast trader versus a slow trader. Um, we can't equalize necessarily that race because you can't ensure that everyone gets the same information at the same exact time when people are in different geographies, different technology, right. et cetera. 350 microseconds is really designed to ensure that IEX as the market center that is pricing trades for buyers and sellers, that a participant can't get information and affect a trade on IEX before we get that same information, which gives us the ability to essentially price trades accurately and fairly. Yeah. And I think that you know, the challenge that we have is that when market centers, when exchanges are incentivized to sell tiers of, of speed, um, like microwave services, but then they use fiber connectivity to price trades in their market, they are essentially selling people the ability to know prices before they do. Right. And I think that undermines the fairness of the market, I, I and I think that it undermines I confidence. That. I only have five minutes, though, Mr. Katsuyama. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think it's been working? It, would it be fair to say it's working? It, it seems to have equalized or, or brought closer together the, the high-speed trader and, and the average uh, I, I, I think that what it's done is it's taken a certain segment of high-speed trading um, that essentially is, is latency arbitrage, and it's minimized that. Okay, and I agree, which, and that's a good thing, and, I, and I, I, I thank you for that. The curious part is that I know you wrote a letter, uh, so the New York Stock Exchange on their American exchange, the smaller fund there, uh, made a move to adopt a similar uh, 350 millionth of a second uh, speed bump, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I guess it is. Uh, and and uh, IEX, much to my surprise, uh, wrote a letter against them adopting a speed bump. Now, if it's just competitive advantage that you're seeking, I'm okay with that. But if there's something else there. Yeah, the, the, the letter actually didn't oppose um, the fact that a market wanted to copy exactly um, what we had built. Okay. The, the, uh, the letter asked that the New York Stock Exchange clarify why they wanted a speed bump. Because the irony is that the speed bump is required because of the things that New York Stock Exchange and ARCA sell to their participants. So New York, on two of their exchanges, is enabling traders to trade at very high speeds. Yeah. Which, and we, as a market, need to protect ourselves. So we found it ironic that New York wanted to launch a speed bump market to protect people in that market from the two other markets they run. We wanted them to tell us why, other than just we want to give people choice. Because if really choice is about investor protection from high-speed trading practices that are predatory, then why wouldn't everyone make that choice? And I think that gets to the heart of, of really my written and verbal testimony. People are being paid to make choices that are contrary to their client's interest. Okay. So uh, we are okay with competition. We are not okay if that competition doesn't clearly state the purpose of the market that you're trying to build. All right, that's fair enough. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And I appreciate the good work that IEX is doing and, and uh, I'm a fan. Thank uh, you. Mr. Whitman, uh, can you talk about uh, the current liquidity uh, that is seen by uh, the top 100 or so stocks that are listed on NASDAQ versus uh, everybody else. It seems to be, uh, all this talk about liquidity is great for the, the well-known stocks and highly traded stocks, but I also suspect that there's a dearth of, uh, of uh, liquidity if you're a smaller company, a startup, uh, some, some, you know, more, more of the innovative and smaller companies coming up. Uh, and there's some that say that, uh, that the market structure is broken in this respect. Can you? Uh, yeah, I think it uh, goes back to our, our one-size-fits-all kind of conundrum where you know, you've got rebate, rebates and market structure that may be working for a class of securities, and they're probably the very liquid securities. Um, you can make arguments that those tick sizes should be smaller and, uh, and that rebates could be smaller in those names. We are focused on those mid and small cap names. They are under liquefied. We have talked about proposals to have unlisted trading privileges revoked for those, have them trade on an exchange to try to pull that liquidity into those securities. And at the same time, uh, as part of my testimony, I talked about more than 50% of trading 
in those kind of securities are trading off exchange. So there's less and less of a reason for market makers to liquefy those securities, which thank is a concern. You. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes at this time Mr. Hollingsworth from Indiana for five minutes. Hey, good afternoon. I really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask was actually to, to Mr. Whitman. You had said something earlier. You said we have gotten to the point where the costs outweigh the benefits in terms of the dispersion of trading and order fulfillment venues. Can you walk me through some of that analysis and your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, as you, as you add fragmentation, so there's been, as you know, Chris and others have talked about, right. you know, it, it spurs the ability to start up new exchanges. Mm -hmm. We have six medallions. We could start three new equity exchanges. And those are protected venues. So there is cost associated with all of our customers, all of our members and broker dealers. So there's cost to them. So what's the actual benefit that we can bring to those, you know, to the marketplace? And you know, you can you can only get to a certain level of, of some creativity there. Right. We think we can probably do a few new things, but that's why we say, and that's why I say that the cost is starting to get to the point with Reagan MS that um, I think we've overstayed um, our welcome with, with uh, those protections. Okay. Uh, with Mr. Farley and Mr. Whitman, I, um, earlier today I heard some, some testimony from individuals that talked a little bit about how, in their view and in their humble opinion, that order or execution quality was significantly poorer on exchanges for small retail mom and pop orders. Um, and they talked about how that divergence doesn't seem to be getting smaller. Instead, it seems to be the same or getting wider over time as alternative venues to order fulfillment seem to be better. Can you talk a little bit about why that might exist and why that divergence seems so great today or as great today as it was three or four years ago instead of converging? Pardon me, could you just repeat, what, what is the diversion you're referring to? Yeah, so earlier today there was some testimony that uh, for mom and pop, kind of order, classic retail investor orders, that the quality of execution on exchanges versus other types of venues is significantly poor. They talked about how so many orders tend to be fulfilled outside of the spread instead of inside the spread, um, and they felt like they were making up spread by going elsewhere. And it was curious to me why that doesn't has it converged over time and why exchanges haven't gotten more and more competitive with regard to kind of the retail order? Yeah, ge generally, uh, it was a little head scratching for me. There were a couple comments in a row, uh, arguing, a couple comments in a row, arguing that executions on exchanges, including New York Stock Exchange, are worse than uh, executions off exchange, which is the opposite of what, of what I've seen. But there is a notable okay. exception, and it relates to this conversation of tick sizes. Mm -hmm. So take Bank of America stock, very large company, high market cap, very liquid, low price stock, let's call it 20 bucks. Yeah. An exchange tra trades it at one penny increments. Mm -hmm. But the theoretical spread for that stock may be one tenth of a penny, or one you know, fifth of a penny, or, or you, get, you get the idea. Right. On an exchange, we can only execute at a penny. Right. We can do a midpoint at half a penny, but, but no real variations right. in between. So actually, there is an ability for retail trades on dark pools mm -hmm. and non-exchange venues to customize that executed price at a, at a better value for a particular retail trader on a particular trade. So there's one real disadvantage that we have, and to some extent, we have our arm tied behind our back because of that, but also because those dark pools can pick and choose exactly who can play in their venue and pick and choose exactly what the economic terms are. So that's something that we, that we wrestle with. Okay. Uh, last question, I, and this is probably maybe too much curiosity, but we've, I hear and see a lot of a demonization of high frequency traders. Um, do they provide any benefit to the markets? Not just to themselves, but to markets overall. I'll start with Mr. Farley and then Mr. Katsuyama. Uh, yes, proprietary market makers are hugely important for our markets mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we do what we can to attract them. We do not demonize them, yeah. and we appreciate their business. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I think the term's too broad uh, yeah. to think that everyone's going to use technology today to purely, you know, provide charitable benefits to the rest of the economy is 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 not accurate. I right. think there are some high speed traders that that use technology to benefit the markets, and there are some that very specifically do not. And I think that uh, it's the exchange's role to ensure that those who do not. But don't have as important of a role to play in the market. 
Well, I don't believe they're doing it for charitable purposes, but uh, you know, the old Adam Smith, people following their own pro profit motivation may, motives may lead to better outcomes for all of us together. And just curious whether those traders play some role in adding more and more liquidity to the market. So those who add liquidity, I think that you know, do provide some, some semblance of, of positive aspects. It's those who remove liquidity. You know, right. A recent academic study said that uh, when look, studying electronic traders, they're adding to the thick side of the book and removing liquidity from the thin side of the book. And their ability to remove liquidity is actually faster than those you know, regular. So it's, it's creating more volatility rather than dampening. You know, one other aspect just on, on your prior question is, so you know, I, I do agree with, with Mr. Brown in, in talking about exchange execution quality not necessarily being as good inside the spread. Mm -hmm. This relates back to my prior comment to say that when an exchange trades inside the spread, it's their responsibility to determine the price inside the spread, i.e. what the midpoint is. Right. So when you're selling people the ability to understand the midpoint before you do, Anyone who rests in order there gets picked off. Yeah. So if you're consistently picking off people who are resting liquidity, you're not going to have as much liquidity inside the spread. Right. IEX has built something differently, which is, you know, back to Mr. Right. Mr. Lynch's point, which is why things are, are successful. So exchanges could improve the execution quality, but it would come at the expense of selling high-speed data and technology, which is not necessarily in their best time economic interest. Makes sense. Thank Ellen's you. time has expired. Uh, with that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Farley, I grew up in a little town called Scarsdale, New York. And when we were kids in Fox Meadow High School, our, our, our class project was to go out, earn our own money, and go down to the New York Stock Exchange and buy stock. It was a very pivotal time in my life the closeness, so I want you to understand how much affection I have for the New York Stock Exchange. I've invested in stocks ever since, and it helped me in my education all the way up to the Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania. That exposure. So I was very concerned when I found out today that the New York Stock Exchange trading is in decline. Could you tell me why? First of all, Congressman, I skip to work every day in part because I get to hear great stories like yours. Thank uh, you. I, in fact, Warren Buffett, and he said I could quote him on it, told me it, when he was 10 years old, he visited the New York Stock Exchange and it set him on a path to free enterprise the rest of his, the rest of his career. So Man. thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your great work in the 13th. As you, as you know, we are duly, you may know, we're duly headquartered in Georgia uh, and New York, so we're, we're a proud Georgian company. And that's why uh, when Jeff Spector said that you all were buying the New York Stock Exchange, man, what a great thing that was. That's why I'm anxious to hear you say why the trading is in decline. Well, I appreciate you giving me that opportunity, and reports of our demise were very premature. Uh, I don't want to kind of crow about our success, but our, our trading is not in decline. We are the market leader and the global leader, Congressman, both for trading, absolute number of shares, but of more pride to me in terms of listings. We lead the world. We're still a beacon for free enterprise throughout the world. This year, we lead the world in IPOs and follow-ons and equ equity volumes. So you need not worry. We are not in decline. Okay, another question I have, uh, Mr. Farley and other members. I am really worried about uh, terrorism and cyber security needs. Could you all share with us? I mean, uh, I do not want you to tell us too much because you have a lot of people out there who would do us harm. But what, what is the status of it? What can we in Congress do or need to do? Because quite honestly, I, be, I believe that the cyber terrorism is the greatest threat to our country right now. And I think you all see that as you look more and more at what Russia is or is not doing and other countries and even those who really want to do us harm, like ISIS. Do we have to worry? Do you guys have it in secure shape for the nation? 
we too at the New York Stock Exchange, and, and I suspect my colleagues share your concern both in terms of physical attacks and, and cyber attacks. And just to answer your question directly, anything you can do to encourage uh, public-private partnership, information sh sharing with the agencies uh, on a real-time basis, as well as allowing competitors to share uh, information free of uh, uh, concerns about collusion and, and antitrust, anything you can do in those realms is, is very helpful. All right. Yes, sir, Mr. Ken. Uh, yeah, I'd love to add, uh, you know, look, the, um, we, the, we all compete very aggressively for every share, every market share in our market. But when it comes to cyber, that's when we all partner. And, and that's the key, as, as Tom mentioned, the ability to partner and share information about uh, recent penetration attempts or any signals that we're seeing as a result of cyber threat. It's a critical area for our markets. I will tell you that all of our markets uh, can only be accessed through a proprietary network. So there is no web-based access to our production platforms uh, in the data centers that they sit. So it's very hard for cyber to penetrate those networks. That doesn't mean we don't take extraordinary protections of those networks because uh, I agree with you that that is one of our number one threats is uh, cyber trying to attack our markets, uh, just generally speaking. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, appreciate it. Gentlemen, yield. If, if I could add one thing there. Um, yes. Not as an exchange. Uh, one benefit of the fragmentation that people um, don't complain about a bit, one benefit is that I believe we have tremendously resilient markets. So we do not have a single point of failure. These, there are different places to trade. The exchanges are talking about how they can, they can provide resiliency amongst the exchanges, and I think that that's really good for the market. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, to our guests. I really appreciate your written testimony and uh, what, you've, what you've already shared with us today. Uh, so it's an honor to talk with you. Um, Mr. Concanon, I wondered if you could uh, add some clarity to the consolidated audit trail that's been uh, in the works for a long time. Uh, two things. One, uh, it doesn't include the futures, futures trades, uh, which your firm knows a fair bit about. And two, uh, and I'll expand this to all of you at a point, uh, it seems that these fir your firms actually sell data that we would already want to know as part of this audit trail. I guess what's different about the data you already have other than it would be standardized if you put it into some other package? Great question. I, I do think there's some confusion about uh, the consolidated audit trail and where things stand with regard to our current surveillance systems. The consolidated audit trail was originally crafted in response to the flash crash and an effort to understand uh, the market in depth. Right now, um, FINRA sees all of our data. Everyone sitting here shares their data, their full depth of book uh, to FINRA. And FINRA also has the entire OTC market in their database and surveils that data uh, either on behalf of the exchanges, uh, which we also surveil our own data, uh, but also on behalf of, of FINRA's own members. Um, so today, there's a very vibrant system of surveillance across not only our equity markets, but also our options market. And the Consolidated Audit Trail is the next step in the evolution of surveillance in the U.S. Um, so we're not missing things today. It's, it's critical that uh, every under, everyone understands that our public markets are today protected by some of the most sophisticated surveillance by the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, uh, and obviously the CBOE. Um, the Consolidated Auto Trail is taking a lot longer than we would want. Uh, there are some sizable costs that the industry are going to have to bear to install it uh, to finish the, the completion of the build. And I think the SEC is going to continue to evaluate what those costs are and the benefits, given how much FINRA does today in surveilling our market. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Farley. Can I just make one quick comment, tying, perhaps tying something uh, Congressman Scott said together with this conversation about the CAT. There was a decision made with the CAT uh, to include personal identifying information of all market participants as part of the CAT. That gives us 
great concern that one entity will have access to all of this sensitive personal information from every man and woman who participates in the equities markets. Don't you already sell that information though? Like if I were a broker, I could buy like stuff to track uh, some of the stuff or not? No, we don't have, as far as I know, we don't have any. And, and that is of, of considerable concern for us and, and it's going to lead to a lot of the cost of the CAT in procuring that personal identifying information. Okay, so here's the challenge uh, that, that people say, hey, one of the reasons we need this, obviously with the flash crash and everything else, talk about cyber, talk about manipulation on, on a very large scale. Sure, it's hard. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how many new markets are launched a day. I think it's less than one a day, but it seems like they're new all the time, right? And uh, I don't know what the theoretical max of numbers of markets are for the United States, but. It looks like we're on a path to discover that. Um, if I am trying to solve a problem, I'm a manufacturing guy, collecting data is really vital. How do you determine a root cause? How do you determine what went wrong, when it went wrong? You can't fix it without knowing certain things. Uh, if none of that's knowable, uh, which is the whole point of, of CAT, uh, what would be the fix? I mean, Fender has already got the truth or what? Yeah, I, I mean, I, right now, the key to surveillance is the data, as you mentioned, and consolidating all of our market data in one place that then can be surveilled for patterns of behavior. That exists today. It's called FINRA. We share our data with, with the regulator called FINRA, and they provide surveillance services uh, on behalf of the exchanges. We, too, each of the individual exchanges sitting here, also surveil that data to look for our own patterns uh, to ensure that FINRA's uh, finding everything that they can uh, find. So I would say we're in a very good state when it comes to surveillance of our markets, and CAT is the next step. Uh, and I would agree with Tom, the introduction of personal information into CAT has exploded the cost of CAT, and uh, mo mostly as a result of the potential cyber threat um, and the, the demand and access for that information. Thank you all. I'm sorry I couldn't get to more. Uh, my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Uh, my first question. Mr. Sherman for five minutes. Sorry. Build on Mr. Scott's question about uh, uh, getting more companies uh, listed and available for investment by the, uh, the general public. Um, Mr. Whitman, I understand that the number of public companies was 8,000 back when I got to Congress in the 90s and is now down to 4,000. Now there are a number of things that could have affected that such as the dot-com bubble or the 2008 crisis or maybe it coincided with me coming to Congress. In any case, uh, the trend seems to be that companies are staying private longer. Um, Facebook a lot of us would have liked to invest before 2012. Um, what are the benefits uh, of public uh, markets and exchanges uh, like uh, NASDAQ, Mr. Whitman, and uh, what do we do to try to get uh, a greater percentage of companies to go uh, public and perhaps earlier in their development process? Yes, this is an area that we're maniacally focused on, and I think uh, to, get a, to get a full feel for it, if you look at the Project Revitalize it, that we publish, you'll get a, a good feel for it. But there are more and more companies that are electing to stay private. Mm -hmm. um, private equity is involved with that. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, as a company attempts to go public, there are a lot of frivolous lawsuits that puts the fear into some companies. Um, maybe the burdensome 10Q process uh, which we look to uh, maybe re re revamping that. Um, um, but, but all in all, you know, I think that we can make some changes uh, to the process for these companies to make it easier for them to go public, and maybe we can get this turned around for the small, mid-sized companies. Mm -hmm. Not only easier to go public, but perhaps less burdens on being public, but at the, uh, and at the same time, uh, some of the things that we've imposed on public companies, such as uh, conflict diamonds and conflict minerals rules, we ought to figure out a way to apply those to public companies if they're important. 
if they're important that, that our society know about that, uh, that uh, that's a burden should fall, fall on major private companies as well. If it's not important and you impose it on public companies, uh, you disadvantage going, uh, going public. Um, the, uh, uh, Mitz, Mr. Katsuyama, um, your fellow exchanges charge for market data. You don't. Why don't you? Um, should they? Should you? <laughs> yeah, so when we look at what it costs to produce and distribute this market data, you know, we build that in, into a trading fee. And I think that, um, you know, market data in many ways is, is interconnected, um, you know, with the system of, of paying out rebates or kickbacks for order flow. Um, you know, the, the net revenue from trading continues to decline for exchanges. Because uh, when you're paying $2.5 billion a year for people to trade on your market, you have to find ways to make money elsewhere. Um, so those sources end up becoming listing fees, market data fees, technology, other connectivity costs, uh, which are skyrocketing. And I think that's what you've, what you've heard from the industry today is that the industry is under the weight of those increased charges. But those charges in many ways are related to make up for the fact that all of this money is being paid out um, for rebates. And I think that you know, the challenge has become is that we've packed regulation on top of managing this conflict. Things like a ban on locked markets, uh, access fee cap, you, you look at some of the regulation that we're struggling with, um, they're designed to manage a conflict as opposed to just addressing the conflict head on. And in many ways, a, a, an efficient market, a competitive market shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't really allow for, for kickbacks. And I think that, that's, me... that's what we struggle with. And I think that, um, you know, I think it's, it's a universal well, Let me cut you off there because I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question. Mr. Farley, are there any listing standards uh, on your exchange in terms of the rights of minority shareholders or uh, the efforts of management to create uh, a total security for themselves, whether they're acting in the best interest of shareholders or not? Uh, do you... Uh, do you require that uh, shares be voting shares or that cumulative voting be allowed or is there any protection uh, or is it whatever the, uh, whatever the government will allow? Uh, the, the, short, the short answer is yes, but I don't have our listing standards uh, committed to memory. And so there certainly are minority uh, shareholder protections and there are rules around voting. Um, but do, is there one question in particular that you are more interested in hearing the answer to? Basically, all of the uh, the efforts to protect uh, shareholders uh, and especially minority shareholders. Yes, but, uh, sure. But I, 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 if if okay by you, I will go back. I look forward to getting yeah, your uh, you. answer for the Submit record, and I you. yield back. Thank you. Ge gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. Thank the chairman. Appreciate the panel being with us uh, today, and. Uh, this is a really important topic. Uh, it's one that we've uh, got two great panels on today, and I appreciate everybody expressing their uh, views candidly to try to help us move this topic forward. I um, appreciate IEX's uh, innovation and leadership in the market, and uh, Mr. Katsuyama, I appreciate your prepared testimony, which I uh, looked at, but I'm, and I, the comments you just made, I'm interested in maybe getting Mr. Farley's uh, response to um, that uh, you, uh, you were asserting maybe that broker-dealers, because they're paid for order flow, were ignoring their best execution responsibility, which I don't think, I don't know, I think that's what you asserted. I just would like Mr. Farley's response to that, because that's, that's an important, you know, I know where you're coming from, but I'd love to hear Mr. Farley's response to that. <clears throat> And uh, indeed, wow. indeed, you indeed you were right on the floor of the exchange. I think yeah. we were in front of the Dillard's the Dillard sign there. Um, you know, I, I, I think broker dealers are uh, conscientious actors, and so I, I didn't come here to demonize one one uh, particular market market segment or, or or another. Is the is the short answer to that question? Broker dealers and others acknowledge that there's an inherent conflict of interest with respect to rebates. The question is, how do you how do you set up the right structure to deal with that? Over time, how do we minimize the existence of that conflict of interest? You know, you, you didn't find our testimony riddled with accusations. There's a lot of good actors in this market, and we should all work together to minimize conflicts while keeping the listed company in mind. 
Well, do you, do you think that uh, the dealer community and the asset manager community should be involved in the oversight of uh, the SIP yes. process? Yes, and what, the, way we've, the way we've advocated for is we have an advisory committee that we've made more and more active over time. And if we're not taking in those views, then we're going to have incomplete policy making. Um, uh, yes, Brad, yes. So I think two things. I think if you ask anyone on the advisory committee whether they feel like that's um, um, a, a valid committee and role, I think they would say no. Um, so I don't think that that gives the full amount of transparency that people are looking for in the industry. I think the second part is, is that, yeah, some brokers do manage this conflict well. Uh, others don't. I think the ones that don't actually end up making more money. I know from a broker's standpoint, riding for rebates makes your business more profitable. It delivers worse results to your client. And if you just look at public data, publicly available data, the longest lines to buy or sell stock are on the exchanges with the lowest likelihood of getting executed and the worst execution quality after you buy or sell shares. They have the longest lines. In any business, in any state of humanity. No one will get on the longest line for the worst outcome. That's what exists today. So I don't need to accuse anyone of anything. Look at public data. The public data tells you everything you need to know. Thank you, Mr. Kachiyama. Um, good, good conversation on that issue. Mr. Uh, Comerford, you note in your testimony that uh, Incinet only considers uh, a third of all U.S. stocks to have the right-sized uh, minimum price increment. Could you peel that back and give us a little bit more information on that assertion? Sure. Thank you for the time. Um, so, what I've what I was talking about is if we, if you think about the one size fits all tick size, um, a absent the tick pilot that we have in our market, the penny, um, a penny is a very different percentage on a ten dollar stock and a hundred dollar stock and a thousand dollar stock, and we have thousand dollar stocks in our market. Uh, my point is also that the tick size, more than anything, even more than the access fee, is still the number one reason why people uh, display lit liquidity. We know that when the percentage, when the consideration, can, the markets work better when costs and considerations are balanced, when the consideration, costs and considerations are balanced between liquidity providers and liquid, liquidity takers. I think of it like a balloon. If you squeeze it too hard in one place, it's going to pop out somewhere else. When the tick size is very large as a percentage terms. What happens is that the, the consideration for liquidity providers is high. That means that a bunch of liquidity providers want to provide liquidity. We get very deep queues, the long lines. We get long lines across all exchanges, whether they're make or taker, inverted, or IEX. And that contributes to complexity um, and difficulty. Trade. And the, the other side of the equation is when the stock price is too when the stock price is large and the tick size is too small. There is very little incentive for liquidity providers to provide liquidity. Spreads actually get very wide. A lot of the trading happens inside the spread, and um, and again, something uh, it's very complex, and I think that does not contribute to confidence in our market. Thanks uh, for your perspective on that, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired. Uh, time has expired, and that is uh, votes being called, but we are going to try to get through these, uh, these last two here. Uh, Mr. Poliquin from Maine for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Thank you all very much for being here. I appreciate it. You know, <clears throat> it seems like everybody in this room, and they should, has a, a great story about the equity market, about capital formation, about, uh, about jobs, about savings. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in a small town in Maine, I used to go over to my, my buddy's house all the time, in particular uh, because of his dad, who was the only person in town who bought a copy of the New York Times. It was the only copy in town, and the reason why he bought the copy of the New York Times is because there was a quote section uh, for, for the stock market. That was way before most of you folks were born. But in any event, I was absolutely fascinated to understand that someone who grew up in a small town of Maine and dug sewer lines and painted metal roofs and cut grass could buy a piece of the American economy. How cool was that? And grow with the economy and grow with these companies. Uh, and I still have the first uh, share, one share of uh, Bath Ironworks my dad bought me for Christmas when I was 12 years old. But in any event, it is good. It is good when you people help us, help retail investors, savers for their retirement, savers for people, uh, for their kids go to college. It's good when you help them go public so these companies can grow and create jobs and pay their employees more and savers and investors can grow with the companies that you bring public. And it was Mr. Sherman, I believe, that uh, mentioned this a minute ago, is that we only have half the number of companies. 
that are public today that were 20 years ago. That is not good for America. So my question to you, Mr. Farley, is um, why do you think this is the case? I know uh, Mr. Whitman mentioned a couple issues about lawsuits and, and so forth and so on, or the liability of lawsuits when you go public. In your opinion, sir, why do you think we have so few companies that have decided to go public instead of staying private, and how can we fix that problem, sir? First, I was hanging on your every word. I couldn't agree more. We have the IPO of Blue Apron coming up this Thursday. Those are the best days of the exchange. That's money going into a great business that can go make the world a better place. There's a number of issues. I mean, there's, uh, please don't quote me on this exact figure. I could be wrong 100 either way. But over the last 10 years, I believe, that, believe there's been 3,500 shareholder class action lawsuits. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a public company, there's a pretty good chance you had to deal with one of those. And if you're Bar Harbor bank shares in your district, that's a big deal. They're very big. If, if, you're, J, if you're JP Morgan, it's, it's, a less, it's a less big deal. But if you're Bar Harbor bank shares, that's a big deal. If you have to deal with a proxy advisor's report that's published without your knowledge that inadvertently includes erroneous materials, you're behind the eight ball with, with shareholders. And that's, that's a difficult situation to be in. Similarly, if you look at Sarbanes-Oxley 404, that was a vote that passed in, in, in the Senate, I believe, unanimously, maybe 99 to 0. Uh, so this was something that had, it was good policy intended there. What wasn't intended is that it would get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And every year there's new, year, new rules propagated by, by the regulators that's making it more and more onerous to comply with. And then finally, there's a shareholder ownership reporting regime that's over a generation old in this country. And so these companies are frustrated that they don't better under, understand their shareholders. Who's short their stock? who owns options and what the value of those options are, and somewhat more real-time information about their shareholdings, although that gets, is a more complex issue because those shareholders would argue, and rightfully, there's real intellectual property in it. So there's a roadmap there to bring America back to that period of 350 being the minimum number of IPOs mm -hmm. to allow the Bar Harbor bank shares to, to flourish, but it's going to take not just you know, work from those of us at this table, but some of, some of the work here in Washington as well. Mr. Farr, I really appreciate these comments, Mr. Farr. Let's talk a little bit about short selling. We may as well. You can do it. You can bet against a company by uh, borrowing the shares at a certain price, or promising to pay them back at a later date. And if, in fact, the company shares go down, you make money. What do you think about that? And how does that impact a company's decision that is private on whether or not they want to go public? You know, it's, I have an emotional reaction, which is it's, it's kind of almost feels kind of icky. An un-American, you're betting against a company. But the, da the data-driven reality is if you get into the numbers, allowing uh, short selling in the economy is actually good for capital formation, uh, tightens spreads and allocates capital to the right companies at the, at the right moment in time. So the real issue that our listed companies have isn't about short selling. In fact, very infrequently do I have a company argue it should be banned in its entirety. Mm -hmm. What they say is, let's have a little more transparency. We have, to, we have to report as investors our long positions every 90 days, but we don't have to report our short positions. And just arming the companies with a little more information like that could help make being public more appealing. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it very much. Are you back by time, Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> Gentleman, gentleman yields back. Uh, the general chair recognizes the vice chairman, Mr. Hulkrin. Thanks. As we all know, there's votes, and there's three of us that still want to have a quick question. So I'm going to just ask about a minute, if that's all right. And Mr. Kincannon, if I can focus on you, thanks again for being here. Thanks for the great work that CBOE does. I wonder if you could respond quickly. I know the assertion that Mr. Uh, Katsuyama made uh, as far as uh, if you could just respond to that. I want to give you a few, few minutes. Sure. I appreciate that. Um, this notion of banning rebates, uh, I just, um, it, it lacks understanding of how our market works. Uh, really, we have, what, what he fails to mention is that uh, the large majority of the, what we call liquidity rebates uh, go to dealers, not brokers. They actually go to market makers trying to form price in our market. These market makers support uh, small companies. They support small ETFs, newly issued ETFs that, that demand that support. Um, and the large broker deals. Now, I agree that some of the size of the rebate probably should be modified as a company becomes more liquid, and this is part of the problem with the one-size-fits-all that we talked about in, in the context of Reg and MS. So while we do regulate uh, this process and we do attach obligations to our market makers to support these stocks in return for these rebates, um, it is a highly regulated uh, a part of our market. Uh, let me continue by saying that when brokers receive rebates, um, they are still subject to best execution. 
It's somewhat insulting to suggest some of the largest brokers in our country are not performing their best execution obligations because of a conflict of interest. There will always be a conflict of interest. We have so many different markets to route to and decide about. There are going to be conflicts of interest. We can't outlaw them. Um, it's really how do they uh, deal with those best execution uh, obligations. They have full committees um, that analyze data. We can change price and we don't see the market react because of best execution obligations. Um, when you look at where all, where the rebates are flowing, uh, again, these are proprietary market makers that are choosing to post bids and offers and form price in our market. That's, that's something that's not um, done in IEX. IEX is largely a dark pool that wrapped itself in an exchange. 70% of the volume in IEX is dark liquidity. It's not a place where market makers want to quote and, and uh, form price to the public market. So it's a, it's a different model. It's a model that uh, someone can choose to route to, uh, but it's different than a traditional exchange that has uh, small companies and small ETF issuers uh, where they need market makers, and that market maker rebate helps support that market maker. That's helpful. Thank you very much. I'm going to yield to uh, my good friend Ted Budd uh, for the remainder of the time, and then he'll be done. Uh, thank you to the vice chairman, and brief question before votes. So, Mr. Whitman, so it's 42 years since 1975. Should Congress take another look at the regu regulatory framework regarding uh, the equities markets? Yeah, I think I think we should. I think. You know, we always want to make things better, and I think that's why we're here today and sharing our, our views. I think you, you can't rest, you can't be complacent. I think we take a look at the areas where, where there are some issues, and let's see what we can do to, to further the conversation and make this market better and get the small, mid-sized companies listing on exchanges again and that capital formation that was talked about a few minutes ago. Thank you. I yield back. I will uh, yield the balance of my time to Mr. Loudermilk, uh, who has joined us today, so thanks. Uh, thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence being here today. And I'll make this as quick as, as possible and, and uh, direct my questions to Mr. Farley. I understand that your business and some of the other businesses represented here today have companies that are affiliate, that have their affiliated companies that, that uh, do work that's not related to uh, affecting uh, uh, trades on the exchange. Can you define maybe what some of those businesses are and the challenges that you're facing with uh, the regulatory environment? Well, actually, it's, it's quite broad. We, we're part of a, a company called Intercontinental Exchange, Inc., which is, by, by some metrics, the largest exchange operator in the world that, op that operates a vast array uh, of businesses from futures trading to data products to regulatory compliance products and, and services. And so what we do with the New York Stock Exchange is incredibly important, but it's only a piece of what the overall business does. And uh, understand that because of the way that the, the code is written now that the, the uh SEC is expanding the regulatory environment to these these businesses that are not involved in the actual exchange operations. Is that true? That's exactly right. It's so the, the SEC can determine what is and isn't a facility of the exchange, and that basically gives a nexus or a hook for significant regulation. And we're seeing that expand, expand, expand to the point where it no longer covers businesses that are, or potentially will cover businesses that are not directly responsible for reporting or affecting a trade. On, on the exchange. They're, they're businesses that are just exogenous to what we do at the NYSC. And so uh, you see a need to modernize the language to clarify the, the term facility, basically. Yeah, I think it would be good for everyone. We compete with firms that uh, do not have such regulatory obligations, and it doesn't really assist in the regulation of the New York Stock Exchange. And we do have legislation affecting that. And so I, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. All time has expired. Um, so I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, I think uh, already we've gotten reports of this being very helpful, very informative. Uh, we'd certainly appreciate your time, your effort for being here. Um, without objection, I would like to submit the following statement for the record. Committee on Capital Markets Regulation, the U.S. Market Equity Markets, a plan for regulatory reform uh, without objection. Um, and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions uh, for the witnesses uh, to the chair, which uh, then I will forward, uh, forward those to the witnesses for their response. Ask our witnesses uh, to please uh, respond in as timely uh, fashion as, uh, as at all possible. 
And uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days with, uh, in which to uh, submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record as well. And so on behalf of all my friends up here, <laughs> Uh, as, as you can see by the countdown clock, we do have votes, uh, but I deeply appreciate uh, uh, your, uh, your flexibility uh, and uh, being here today. Uh, it has uh, been extremely illuminating and very helpful, I think, and I know that this is hello, not goodbye. Uh, we're going to be uh, continuing to have this conversation, and I look forward to working with, uh, with all of you. So with that, our hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Chairman.